Alrighty, hi everyone. We're just at one o'clock, so I think we should jump right into this. Um, welcome to the GSA Quality Partnership Council meeting. My name is Chris Stein, and I'm going to be your MC for the entire meeting. Um, I am part of the business development team, supporting all of our furniture offerings, and I'm thrilled to to participate in this uh, this event today. Um, I do have a few housekeeping notes, and then we're going to jump right into it. Ivana, can you jump to the housekeeping notes? Terrific, thanks. Um, so in this meeting, all attendees, meaning all participants, you um, are muted because um, we, we have a huge turnout today. There's more than 500 attendees online with us. Uh, but we have a Q&A box that's gonna be open for you during the entire meeting. And that's how you're gonna communicate and because uh, I'm sure you're gonna have ton, tons of questions for our speakers. So don't be shy, add your questions to the Q&A box. Um, we encourage you to type the questions and comments completely throughout the meeting. Um, regardless of the speakers. And any questions, um, even if they're not answered live by our speakers, know that they're gonna be shared with our speakers and um, they will be shared with you after the event as a, uh, as a Q and A sheet. And um, we are recording today. And as I said, the everything when we share the Q and A sheet, we will also be sharing the slides and that recording. Closed captioning is, is available. And you can see from the chat window how to do that. And you can download the agenda with links to the breakout sessions in the chat window. So with that, I'm gonna get started. I wanna introduce Dina McLaughlin. Dean is our regional commissioner and she's the government-wide category management for, category manager for office management, which includes furniture. Dina. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our second fully virtual QPC meeting, or Quality Partnership Council meeting. As many of you know, this forum has been underway for many, many years, but this virtual option continues to give us greater reach as we have upwards of 500 attendees today. As always, GSA can count on this community to actively participate in important conversations, and you're always willing to share your feedback and ideas as we work together to better support federal agencies. So thank you so much for, for tuning in this afternoon. So if you're new to the Quality Partnership Council, welcome. The QPC is one of our primary forums to foster a better understanding between customers, industry, and GSA for the furniture and furnishing subcategory. I also wanna give special thanks to our QPC board members for developing today's agenda. As always, we really appreciate your partnership and your willingness to work with us. I also wanted to welcome uh, Mark Voris from the Air Force. We truly appreciate you taking time to share some updates on the Air Force's furniture acquisition strategy with us today. Having uh, agencies and customers come to the QPC is always one of the uh, most well-received parts of the agenda. So thank you so much, Mark. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to all of our other uh, great speakers we have lined up for you today. We have, of course, our uh, uh, IWAC, our Integrated Workplace Acquisition Center team, leadership team, Brian, Meg, John, and Ivana, who I believe are familiar faces uh, to most of you. Jane Schuster from GSA's Public Building Service has joined us today. Thank you, Jane. We'll have Deb Ebel from the GSA Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. And we also have the Catalog Management Team. Uh, Catalog management is uh, one of the efforts underway and it is one of GSA's federal marketplace strategy cornerstone initiatives and Mike Shepard, Josh Voriko, and Peter Hahn will be with us today to talk to you more about that. So before I turn you over to them and the rest of the agenda, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the office management category at large and uh, a little bit of, of what's been happening there in work in the category. So the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, forced the federal government to adopt a telework first posture, which appears to have had a positive impact on the GSA mission. While GSA doubled the hours it teleworked, employee engagement and customer satisfaction actually hit all time highs. Other agencies have also experienced similar positive results and like GSA are rethinking the future workplace and the employee experience. And of course, I know that this is a, a great topic of interest for this community. 
Uh, in the office management category, we want to make sure agencies receive support for any resulting demand to outfit employees with furniture, office supplies, or other products they need to work uh, efficiently and safely at home. As such, we're exploring existing purchasing solutions that may be suitable for supporting home office supply and furniture needs. So we're working through those options and we also want to be sure that we can provide customer agencies guidance in these areas as we all know there are lots of rules uh, that must be followed. So from a category perspective, uh, we're also working closely with PBS on several initiatives that will help determine the future of federal work. As I mentioned, Jane is with us today and she'll soon provide the latest on the Workplace 2030 initiative, which is looking at innovative services that agencies may require. Uh, I hope Jane is gonna speak to us things like home office in a box, uh, the workplace prototype technology showcase, uh, GSA space as a service, space monitor feedback and work support app. So lots of different ideas in this space that we look forward to hearing from Jean. So otherwise, how are we doing in the office management category in terms of obligations from customers? So we're seeing higher obligations year to date for office management, which I just wanna mention includes office supplies, office services and furniture. So we're seeing higher obligations year to date than in previous years. This is great news. There is an upward trend in spend under management, which is something we track. So spend under management really means contracts that agencies are um, managing uh, agency-wide or government-wide contracts or best-in-class contracts. All of them, all of those three categories fall under spend under management. So that trend has continued, this upward trend, despite the impact of COVID-19 in our category. Again, pretty encouraging news. Some is closely linked to the reduction of tier zero contracts. These are uh, one-off or open market contracts. Um, and the category has done well to reduce the unmanaged spend contracts over the last three years. Why should industry care about this? Well, it's less, less contracts for you to manage, right? You put a lot of effort into putting a GSA schedule contract in place or an agency-wide uh, contract and uh, less contracts for you to manage, uh, the easier it'll be and the more efficient government can be. So we've also in the category maintained high level of small business spend, traditionally the highest of all the categories, so we're proud of that. And overall office management uh, had a strong year in FY20 in line with previous years. So again, this was a bit of a surprise given uh, the challenges we faced with COVID. So moving gears just a little bit to talk to you about what's happening at GSA or what's important to FAS, especially with the new administration. Some of you may have had an opportunity to hear our new commissioner, Sonny Hashmi, speak at, uh, in other forums. But you may have heard that the administration uh, has outlined key initiatives, right? There are four addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, energizing the economy, fighting climate change, and addressing the issues of racial injustice, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility. So GSA will have an important role in supporting all of these priorities. So it's critical to me that we maintain and grow our partnership with you, as we always have uh, in Region 3. This Quality Partnership Council dates back, I know it's more than 25 years because we celebrated that mile marker. Uh, and, and we always appreciate your engagement. So you enable us to pivot when our priorities shift and our challenges change, and, and we expect that to continue in this current administration uh, and in light of facing the challenges of the COVID uh, pandemic. So as always, this community actively participated and is not disappointed in response to COVID. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you very much for working hard to continue to keep your businesses running smoothly so that we could collectively support federal agencies in their efforts. Thank you as well for your ongoing responsiveness as we work with PBS in support of federal agencies returning to the workplace and the evolving needs they may have. So I recognize that COVID has been a huge challenge for you, our industry partners, and even more so for the small businesses who even pre-COVID typically find it hard and challenging to do business with the federal government. So I'm happy to see that two small US manufacturers with GSA contracts will be spotlighted today. 
Uh, there are many more out there that large businesses can work with to support this priority while also meeting uh, customers' complex requirements. So we're fortunate to have Deb Ebel here uh, later in the agenda to get us all thinking about opportunities to support this priority. And as well, John Green will be sharing information on contracting teaming arrangements in one of the breakout sessions. So while I'm very proud of the work that our team has done to meet, and in many cases even exceed our small business goals, a lot more can be done there. And we continually welcome your ideas, of course. This is an important priority to increase the number of small businesses that represent small minority and underserved communities and figuring out how we can make it easier for them to do business with the government. So your participation today and honest feedback and communication is always encouraged, so thank you. So I'm getting close to the end here, but just a couple more things. Uh, in regard to making it easier to do business with us, I mentioned Catalog Management Initiative. Uh, this is one of the federal marketplace strategy initiatives to help GSA improve the way uh, the marketplace for buying and selling with the government. So it's really an important effort uh, to modernize the systems and streamline the processes and policies we use to manage catalogs, to manage the over 50 million products and services GSA manages. So what we're trying to do here is make it easier for our industry partners and our workforce to manage catalogs and ultimately improve the quality of the data we're serving to our customers on e-commerce platforms like GSA Advantage and other downstream applications. So we know in this space that the furniture industry has unique needs and concerns. We've heard you loud and clear, and we need to address it. We need to address those concerns by introducing more flexibility into how we collect and store data. So we have the team here today uh, to talk to you more about that uh, this afternoon. So lots of big challenges ahead, but I'm super excited that we have a team of very smart, dedicated people here at GSA to tackle them and take advantage of these new opportunities. As always, I'm very grateful for our partnership with industry. So thank you for being here this afternoon. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan. Thanks, Dina. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you that are new to QPC, my name is Ryan Schrank and I'm the IWAC Director. First off, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Echoing Dina, thanks to all the speakers taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us as well. Big thanks to Ivana Henry and Chris Stein and the entire uh, QPC board for their efforts in organizing the event. So just before we get into the, what IWAC will be covering, I would like to introduce the leadership team participating today. So we have John Breen, our projects branch chief, and he leads our furniture projects and NSN programs. We also have Ivana Henry, our business development director, who leads our customer outreach efforts and industry engagement. We also have Meg Sudliff, who leads our multiple award schedules contracting branch. So speaking of Meg, just wanted to provide a quick leadership update. So after 40 plus years of federal service, Meg will be retiring on July 2nd. Retirement for Meg sure will be busy as she's gonna be helping take care of the grandkids. But after a few months, she may be wanting to join us back here in Iowa. We'll see how that goes. But kidding aside, Meg, you have provided amazing leadership to the IWAC Mass Program over the last 10 years. You've worked hard to build trust and trusted relationships with industry and customers through QPC and uh, our other forums. Many of you don't necessarily get to see the day-to-day -day operations and working with Meg, but she's been a mentor, a friend, and a trusted uh, colleague to us all and an invaluable resource in IWAC and GSA Region 3 for the last 10 years. And to say Meg will be missed is probably a huge understatement. So while we congratulate Meg on her retirement, there's uh, some additional news to share. So we were able to hire Meg's backfill, uh, Sean Kelly, who is uh, gonna be taking over the role and taking over the reins for Meg once she retires. So this will allow for some strong transition for this important role, some continuity of operations. So there's, there's positives with that. During his career with GSA, Sean served as a contracting officer, contract specialist, supervisory contract specialist. He's been a QPC board member. He's also supported many of our enterprise initiatives. So catalog management, mass consolidation, shifting to the calc tool, Sean's been a participant in all those areas, so he's well-versed in what the IWAC MASS program it does and what they're capable of. So we're excited for Sean to move into that new role and continue the great work of the MASS branch. So congratulations to Meg on her retirement and congrats to Sean on his promotion. So as we move into the formal agenda, uh, here's the areas that we're gonna be covering with the IWAC session. 
First and probably at the forefront of a lot of folks' minds is an update on the packaged office audit that we received back in March. And I'll also share an update on business volume through the IWAC program through second quarter of fiscal year 21. Sean and Meg will provide an update on IWAC's operational metrics. And also later in, in uh, the session, we'll uh, give a, uh, some training on economic price adjustments, which has been coming up somewhat regularly. John will give an update on the opportunity pipeline for IWAC and NSN as well. And Ivana will take some time to give a, an update on upcoming training and the supplier relationship management survey that's out there now. And as time permits, we're definitely open to any questions you may have for the IWAC leadership team. So common question that's been asked over the last several weeks, are there any updates on the packaged office program and the audit that was issued in March? So for context, as many of you are aware, there was a GSA FAS level audit. So it wasn't a regional audit, it was a FAS level audit on the program. And there was findings around the fact that we do not require CSPs from our packaged office vendors for the product portion of the offering. From IWAC's perspective and, and our contention all along is that these items were already assessed and determined fair and reasonable under the manufacturer CSP and uh, the award of contract. The audit, the audit did highlight concerns in this area. Throughout the audit process, we attempted to provide some education for OIG, give them some better insight to the intent of the program. And really what that is, is we have our packaged office vendors acting as service integrators and then partnering with our mass schedule contractors to provide the total turnkey solution. We provided them with policy, council concurrence, et cetera, with how the program operates, but it wasn't necessarily enough to change the outcome of the report. We were able to get some changes to the report as well, which I think are gonna prove helpful in the long run. Initially, OIG was requiring CSP1s for all of the products that go through the packaged office program. However, we did push back in that area. and We were given some flexibility in the auto recommendation language. From our perspective, there could be multiple avenues to bring the program into compliance based off of the OIG feedback. So we wanted an opportunity to assess these, uh, these different options with our stakeholders which includes you as industry and our customers. Our initial thoughts out the gate were establishing contractor teaming arrangements or CTAs at the program level. And we'll be hearing more about those at the breakout session. Because the way we view it is in many cases, the service providers, which are small businesses in most cases, will still receive the revenue for the integration support services. So thinking the project management, the design support, the install support, whereas the manufacturers would receive the business volume for the products as part of the total solution, which is honestly how the program's intended to operate. Letters of supply are already required through the program. Could we supplement with the CTA? Would that work? Or is there other ways? Does industry have other thoughts or perspective that can bring the program into compliance based off of the OIG feedback? That will be part of a larger discussion with you all as industry partners. We did submit a corrective action plan, which is being reviewed by GSA leadership and the inspector general, and we're waiting on acceptance around that plan. Corrective action plans are fairly high level and no path has been, has been decided at this point. Really what the CAP does is it's highlighting high level steps we'll, that we'll be taking to engage with our industry partners, our customers, to develop the, be the best path forward to address the recommendations. And in a few minutes, Sean will be discussing some of those next steps, including industry outreach that we'll be doing. So the bottom line here is that we are looking for a solution that would have the least impact on our shared customers and hopefully keep business volume strong through the program. So we're gonna be looking for your ideas, your perspectives. There will be working groups established through QPC and other forums. So really today is kickstarting that engagement, opening up that conversation, and at least giving you some of our thoughts in that area. So for next steps, I'm going to turn it over to Sean Kelly, who's going to briefly give you an update on some of the outreach planned in the coming weeks as part of the corrective action process. So Sean, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Ryan had indicated, um, we're going to be reaching out very soon um, to do some outreach in order to get some feedback um, you know, on the, the potential corrective actions. Um, that we can take. So we have developed a survey um, with a list of approximately 10 questions. Um, you know, some simple yes, no, others, we, we're looking to get a little more information from you. Um, our intention is to send that out either tomorrow or Monday. Um, so it'll be coming to you very soon. 
keep an eye out for a link. Um, I believe it's going to be coming from um, Ivana or Chris through our business development team. Um, and our, our goal is to, is to get your feedback, you know, to hear your voice. Um, we, we want this to be a collaborative effort, um, and, and that's ultimately our goal. So the, the survey is the first step to get your initial thoughts and feelings. Um, and then from there, like Ryan said, we're gonna be creating some uh, working groups um, and, and we'll be able to discuss the, those survey results in a little more detail with those. Um, so look, look forward to that over the next couple of days. Um, and we're looking for, forward to your feedback. Thanks, Sean, appreciate it. And you know, that's just so you know, we're not gonna be making decisions in a vacuum here. You're definitely gonna be participants with a you know seat at the table, helping us come up with what solution works for industry. And probably more importantly, what works for our customers to ensure they're still getting the solutions they need through the packaged office program. So with that, we'll go to the next slide and just give you an update on uh, business volume uh, for FY21. So really, um, you know, the goal here is to con convey that sales have been steady. Um, sales have been steady. There you go. Sales have been steady through the furniture space through the first six months of the fiscal year. So. You know, it looks like a slight growth there, pushing close to 1%. Uh, you know, we are starting to see some drips and drabs of third quarter numbers. And it does look like there may be a little bit of drop in the third quarter, but nothing substantial. You know, I think the shared concern for our industry partners and, and through us here in the IWAC Center was that COVID would potentially experience a large drop in sales and business volume through the program. We're not necessarily seeing that as of yet. So we're going to continue to monitor. We're going to continue to look for opportunities to drive more spend through the schedule solutions and keep doing what we do through our business development team and other avenues to, to continue to grow the portfolio and hopefully drive business to you all as our industry partners. So with that, Ivana's going to open up a quick poll because we are curious. We're curious what you're seeing from a commercial perspective. So are you seeing uh, growth in the commercial side? Has it been steady as, it's, as we're seeing through the government side? Or have you seen growth? Or really, like, you know, it might be an instance where you're not too sure. Maybe that's not your area that you focus on. But, uh, you know, if you could take a moment to answer that, uh, it'll help us see how things are going on the commercial side and how they parallel to the government. I could do the Jeopardy song, but I'll just sit in silence. We're still collecting responses, Ryan. So okay, let's give it another you, minute. You, so. you know me in silence; it's unbearable. But I'll <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, so it, it you know it does look like a bit of a mix with you know greater being in the declining area. Um, you know, that, like right now we're kind of holding that smidge of growth through the first uh, six months of the fiscal year. And, you know, we'll see where we go, but, you know, we're, we're all doing the best we can to continue to, to drive business through the schedules program and uh, other avenues. So thanks for sharing that feedback. And it kind of helps us see where we're at from a you know, federal government perspective. I would say that we're probably more in the steady state versus the growth or the decline at this point. So thank you for the time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Sean, who are going to provide an update on our IWAC metrics. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so we, we just wanted to give a quick update on the IRAC metrics, um, specifically our cycle time for modifications. Um, so we, we've received some feedback lately that, um, that, that there may be the perception that our mod cycle times are down and it's taken us a little longer you know, to process your modification requests. Um, so as you can see here, Region 3's modification cycle time is 6.12 days, which far outpaces um, the other portfolios within Federal Acquisition Service um, and far outpaces the average of 16.66 days. Um, so compared to, so the, this is within FY21, compared to the same time in FY20, we are up a tick, um, 6.12 this year compared to 5.89 last year. So it, 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 it's almost the same. I, I think we may be able to attribute a little bit of that uptick um, with mass consolidation and, and all of the, 
administrative actions that have to be taken, you know, in regards to phase three. Um, as we wind down, I, you know, I, I think we can, I think we can expect our mod levels to remain the same or, or get back to that FY20 level. Um, but again, they're, they're, they're very, very close. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out was our acceptance rate in region three. So we accept 78% of the modifications that are submitted to us, uh, which indicates that we have a very low level of rejections, um, you know, for our mods. So when the mods come in, you know, our, our CEOs and CS are doing their due diligence in, in a very timely manner. Um, and, and, and we expect that to continue. And with that, I will turn that over to John. Thanks, Sean. So as, as Ryan mentioned, uh, business has been relatively stable uh, within our category. And that has been also our experience uh, with our assisted acquisition um, business line. In terms of traditional projects, uh, a couple upcoming opportunities worth noting. Uh, Region 9 and 10 BPAs. Uh, this is a program that's about 15 years old and it is continuing. There's still a need for that vehicle and we are planning to issue an RFQ in, in about a, next, a week or so. So be on the lookout for that RFQ. If you don't see it or have questions about it, you can reach out to me or my staff members and we'll make sure that you have an awareness of that that um, RFQ. Department of Education is a new customer of ours. We have done a couple of projects for them over the last two years or so that have been, you know, mid to large size projects in a million dollar area or so. And um, they are now becoming a repeat customer of ours. They're happy with our service and asked us to put together uh, a BPA on their behalf. So that is in process. Uh, discussions have commenced and we hope to wrap them up soon and make an award uh, in this quarter of the fiscal year. Some of you may be familiar with the FIT program. It is the Furniture and Information Technology Program. Uh, for those of you not familiar, it is a program whereby GSA buys furniture and information technology products and leases them to customer agencies in partnership with PBS. So that's about $12 million in business per year on the furniture side of the house. And we have a couple of projects that are close to award at this time. Uh, one is for the Department of Labor. That's about a three quarter of a million dollar opportunity. And we have another small opportunity that whereby GSA is the actual end user in region two in New York. And uh, both of those are pending awards, which should be made momentarily. Another program uh, that we uh, manage is the National Stock Number Program. That is a requisition based program whereby we establish BPAs agencies order them directly uh, using mill strip and fed strips, which are or funding documents and the products ship directly from the factories to the end user. So this, this product is typically not product that requires installation. It can be assembled by the customers themselves. And there's a high level of activity in terms of the number of orders uh, in this program. Much of it is supported by ability one, but commercial, partners do provide a substantial portion of the NSN product and upcoming is an opportunity in the realm of executive case goods and just like the case with uh, the region 9 and 10 BPA that RFQ is also anticipated for June 16th and this will be set aside for small business so with that I could turn it over to Ivana Thanks, John, uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, my name is Ivana Henry, and I lead our business development team. Uh, in case you're new or you weren't aware that IWAC has a BD team, yes, we do, and we are here to help you uh, get answers to any of your questions or access any support that you might need to serve our federal agencies. Um, you should also note that Christine Stein, who organized and is moderating today's event, is your main uh, BD point of contact for the furniture and furnishings category specifically. Uh, many of you know her uh, pretty well and have received emails directly from her, but I wanted to also uh, make you aware that we're also behind those other email updates that you may receive from qpc at gsa.gov or furniture at gsa.gov. 
So you can always reach out to us at those email addresses as well if there's anything we can do to make it easier to do business with us or to serve our customers. Um, as Sean said, uh, we'll be sending out uh, that survey uh, on the MAS team's behalf uh, from the QPC at gsa.gov email, so look for that. Um, that said, I have uh, information to share on two outreach efforts that I uh, think you should want uh, to consider taking advantage of. So first, GSA's FAST 2021 training conference is next week. It's three days, Tuesday through Thursday, 1230, uh, 1230 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time each day. Uh, the conference is free for both federal employees and all of you uh, as industry partners. Uh, and I'm told uh, there are about uh, close to 4,000 federal customers registered already. Um, for the topics and the speakers, uh, you'll find that uh, detailed on the website here, uh, gsa.gov fast 2021. Uh, but if you have your mobile device handy, you can also uh, use your camera and scan this QR code on the screen uh, and register right now if you like. Second, uh, GSA's 2021 Supplier Relationship Management Survey is currently open and it's collecting responses until the end of the month, June 30th. You are really our ears and eyes in the federal marketplace. So it's important that we hear from you, both what we're doing well and what's needed to build a better partnership with you. I, I know that uh, we're all so busy and uh, I myself get surveyed out sometimes but your voice really does matter. In fact, it's feedback from this survey um, that's conducted annually that directly contributed to many of the improvement initiatives underway in GSA. One of them being the catalog management initiative that uh, we'll all be getting update on later uh, this afternoon. So your feedback on this survey, it, it's really important, but it's really important to me personally and the VD director and to the, um, to the IWAC team because we do get these results broken out at the furniture category level, which means that we can use that um, information from you to help us figure out what we need to keep doing and where we might need to make some changes to our operation centers in the uh, Integrated Workplace Acquisition Center. However, um, the uh, issue that I have uh, with these responses is the response rate. It's always much lower than we would like. So if you'd like to make my year, um, I'd love to get at least as many survey responses as we have uh, participants in today's event. Um, so please uh, check your email. Um, you should receive a unique survey link um, and take some time to tell us honestly what we're doing well or what we can do better. If you don't have the email, there's this email address here, surveys at research.gsa.gov. You can send them an email, um, tell them that you hold a GSA contract under the furniture category and that you haven't received the link. Um, and, and that way, hopefully they'll get you the information or the link so you can provide uh, us your feedback. If you email that address and you still don't get a survey link, let me or Chris or email qpc at gsa.gov so we can try to help you out because it's that important to me that you're able to be heard. So on behalf of the whole IWAC team, I wanna thank you for your partnership um, and we'll now uh, all come on screen uh, to answer as many questions um, as we have. Uh, so Chris, do we have yeah, any questions? We do, thanks Ivana. Um, the first question I have, I think is, is probably best answered by you, Ryan. Okay. It's, it's about the packaged office program. Okay. Question, yeah, the, <laughs> the question that came in is, uh, did IWAC make any attempts to dissuade the GSA Inspector General in the evaluation of the packaged office program? So dissuade's kind of a, I, you know, I don't, I won't read like by dissuade, probably not, you know, the OIG can pick what they want to audit and, and that's what they do. Right. That's, that's their job. Um, did we attempt to better educate them on the program and the intent of the program? I would say, yes. I, I think we tried our best to give our, our viewpoint on this and, and how it's operated for 30 years, right. Successfully uh, operated for 30 years. Uh, but, you know, sometimes from by way of their perception and how they view things, that's hard to change. They they had a thought that products should be, you know, have their own CSPs through this program. We disagreed. We do a ton of work and there's a ton of audits that go through our manufacturing side of the house. And we thought that that would be sat, you know, satisfactory due diligence, right? That uh, with the level of audits that happen on the manufacturer side, as well as the packaged off the side, that, that we were pretty well covered. Um, you know, in the end, I, I think uh, some of the thoughts were is that there were 
some paths to bring it into compliance that would hopefully be somewhat not too disruptive and CTAs has been mentioned in the past. Uh, we're gonna look at other avenues that uh, industry may have. But yeah, there, there was a, a fairly good push to uh, educate and, and bring forward how the program intends to operate. Um, it obviously didn't result in what we were looking for in the audit report, but we did get uh, you know what I would call substantial flexibility in coming up with a solution. And uh, hopefully we're able to work that with industry or customers that use the program and and uh, you know keep it minimal, minimally disruptive to how the program intends to operate. I hope that answers the question, but uh, you know we we did our best. I would say from my perspective. Thanks, Ryan. Um, we do need to move on to our next speaker, but I do have one more question to squeeze in here. Um, will there be more automation to make mods instant? Um, this person said that they thought they they said other contract organizations process in 24 hours and curious of the long term goal for us. Yeah, I'll probably defer to Meg on that one if, yeah. if Meg has a thought. But you know the you know a 24 hour turnaround on a mod, like I would probably ask to clarify what the mod like the type of mod was. Um, you know that has a lot of impact in in cycle times. You know, if we were looking at a new product line or trying to determine fair and reasonable to do that in 24 hours would be, I would say, pretty aggressive uh, from a due diligence standpoint. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know if Meg or Sean have any uh, additional feedback or perspective, but certain mods, sure, 24 hours, if they're low hanging fruit and depending on that CS's workload at that time. But, um, you know, that that's pretty aggressive. Yeah, I I. And I 100% agree with that, uh, Ryan. There's there, there's a lot of analysis that has to go um, into the mods. So so yes, we probably could be processing mods within 24 hours. But uh, what would the quality of uh, of those mods be? However, saying that there are certain types of mods that are automatically processed, and there are um, price price reductions either permanently or or or. Uh, temporary price reductions, they are like immediately effective. However, a modification on the back end is still is still required. But but um, we have a metric that we have to process th those are within three days and they are pretty much processed within a day or two. So, but um, yeah. And, and I would ask whoever, wherever the question came from, you know, we're always open to benchmarking. If there's things that you're seeing in other centers or, or even other activities that aren't GSA, um, you know, feel free to reach out to myself, Meg, through July 2nd, and Sean, and uh, we're, we would be happy to, to benchmark and hear more about that. So feel free to reach out to any of us. Happy to talk more. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks to Ryan, John, Meg, Ivana, Sean. Um, terrific updates. Um, time to move on to our next speaker. Next up, we have Jane Schuster. Jane is with PBS, GSA's Public Building Service, and she's going to talk to us about something called Workplace 2030, which sounds pretty exciting to me. Um, so, Jane? All right. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, just wanted to confirm you can see my screen. Should be sharing the slide deck. You're good, Jane. Okay, perfect. So, um, well, welcome. I really appreciate the ability to come and speak in front of this audience today because typically I've been giving a similar type of presentation for a more broadly customer type of audience. And so getting feedback from industry is really exciting for me. Uh, just a really quick intro on myself. I am Jane Schuster. I represent the Center for Workplace Strategy in the public building service side of GSA. So I'm an interior designer by trade and my center for workplace strategy team typically works with customers mostly on an external customer to GSA basis on all things related to workplace. So lots of our work really focuses on workplace engagements and how to make spatial changes for our customers in their workplace to promote efficiency and effective workplaces. And of course now really looking at how to promote flexibility within the workplace. So thinking about the last 15 months of the pandemic have really allowed us to have these tremendous learning experiences. In, in many ways, I would call it a, a forced workplace experiment. And for many of our customers, this transition to nearly 100% telework overnight was fairly smooth. And these new ways of working that have emerged over the last year and a half 
will likely continue to support new ways that they're working in the future in the post pandemic world. Um, however, for other agencies, the last 15 months have really been a challenge and the limitations of technology have been made clear. And then on the other side, we have these customers, for example, law enforcement type of agencies who simply have missions that can be accomplished from a distributed or home work environment. So agencies like these have continued reporting to the workplace day in and day out throughout the pandemic. But for the most part, as I talked about, these federal agencies that have experienced really dramatic changes in the way that we work due to what we've learned from the pandemic, some of these changes are truly unimaginable if we think about what, where we were just over a year ago. So most notably, as Nina had actually kind of teed up in her opening remarks is at the start of 2020, work was primarily accomplished in the office and telework was this employee benefit and that's how it was perceived. But we found that there's such um, receptiveness to telework and flexibility that, uh, that allows. And so now that we're seeing telework is this truly integral part of how we continue to deliver our mission and really how telework can help us think about our future real estate needs. So GSA realized that we needed to study these impacts of the pandemic and the way that they were changing the way our future workplace functions. So we began our Workplace 2030 study last fall and really the idea here was to explore the impacts of the long-term federal workplace. And what we did is convene external customer agencies to GSA. So we had 17 different external customer agencies and various GSA experts, including Dina herself, to co-create this vision of what the future of the workplace might look like. So, you know, we're really recognizing that the high levels of telework satisfaction is impacting the future workspace needs. So today what I want to do is share some key highlights from our Workplace 2030 study and talk a bit about how GSA is starting to adapt our services to support these new ways of working. So before getting into that, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit and let you know that in the early 2000s, GSA created a project we called Workplace 2020. And that project studied very similar things that we're looking at through Workplace 2030. We're looking at the future of work and the way it was accomplished. And I also want to note that Workplace 2020, despite the name, um, it actually doesn't refer to the year 2020. So early 2000s, we weren't actually looking ahead two decades. The name 2020 refers to looking at the workplace with clear or 2020 vision. So that 2020 study was focusing on how the workplace supported things like health and well being and attracting and retaining talent and really engaging employees. All of these things that we're doing right now and really focusing on through the pandemic, what we've discovered is these things are so important and will remain just as important or even more important in the future. So that Workplace 2020 study from the early 2000s and then subsequent projects that we completed at GSA and with our partner customer agencies, in my opinion, truly did prepare the federal government for the pandemic, allowing us on many, many levels to nearly overnight transition to 100% or nearly 100% telework. So the pandemic has provided these real time lessons and this data about how that shift to a more distributed work model which was taking place pre-pandemic already, could support the well-being of the future federal employee, support the pursuit of agency mission, and really thinking about how the pandemic has fundamentally changed the way we think about the future physical workplace. So to seize the moment that we're in right now, we realized at GSA that we needed a vision of what the future could be as well as how GSA could respond and make that future a reality. So the vision that we developed through our Workplace 2030 study is that the future of work is becoming placeless. We're finding work can be done anywhere, anytime. That doesn't mean that it should be done everywhere all the time. I do wanna be clear about that. Also, we still need real estate, even though we might not need it to the same extent we did pre-pandemic. But in the future, what we'll see is real estate will be used to maintain and enhance these human connections rather than simply being the place where typically most work occurs. And then also technology is the glue that's going to continue bringing us together 
allowing us to collaborate regardless of where we are located and regardless of schedules. So through our Workplace 2030 project, a series of guiding principles emerged. And what I want to do right now is share a few of those guiding principles and, and what we came up with. So first, I want to caveat that you guys are experts as well in your industry. And I will say that this information I'm sharing here is not groundbreaking. And it's probably similar to all the white papers, the seminars, the panels and articles that you're probably seeing or participating in every day. But what I want you to take away from this conversation today is that what we've discovered from the federal government perspective is aligning with what you all and we all are seeing in the private industry and across the world. So the first guiding principle leading our Workplace 2030 project is that concept that distributed work is trusted. So through this project, what we found is that this moment in time has truly shown that we can no longer assume where job activities must be performed. So our Workplace 2030 working group made many key discoveries. And prior to 2020, most of us were working in the office as the default. And what we were doing is utilizing telework as this employee benefit. And many of our customers looked at telework as being an ad hoc solution for accommodating work in some sort of situation, like an extreme weather event, for example. So work from home or other locations pre-pandemic was possible, of course, but it wasn't widespread across the federal government. So pre-pandemic work from home was seen as an employee benefit. But moving forward, federal employees have certainly demonstrated that distributed work can yield high quality results and as a result of this successful forced distributed modes of work from the last 15 months, telework can now be used as this real estate and portfolio strategy to potentially helping reduce the federal footprint. So of course, that's not to say that the office is going away. We still want the office, but the genie is out of the bottle in terms of working from home. And what we see is that work can, that can be done from home probably in the future will continue to be done there. The office will certainly remain a critical asset. We just need to really focus, refocus on that office and what we need it to do most. So, you know, truly we need the office to be that place to meet and collaborate, a place for making and maintaining human connections. And then of course, a place for these costly resources like secure communications facilities or labs where we can't duplicate that work in the home office. Um, and then lastly, of course, we still need the office to remain a place for those of the workers who can't work from home or the workers that simply don't want to work from home. So remote work really does allow agencies to recruit and retain the most qualified talent no matter where they live. So employees may choose to live where it best suits them, giving them that flexibility in their lives outside of work, leading to even that potential to stay with the government longer than they may have previously. So if someone's spouse has been relocated somewhere in the country, that federal employee may not have to leave their job because they might be able to do their work remotely or in a distributed manner. Really refocusing on facilities will require significant investments, of course, but sharing resources among agencies would help create these cost savings over time which these cost savings could then be reinvested in agency missions. So through our Workplace 2030 conversations, we're seeing that agencies really do support that idea of creating these shared federal spaces that we can all use. So once we come to the other side of the pandemic, we see that employees will want to continue working where it best suits the task at hand. So they'll likely come to the office less frequently. And when they do, they'll find a different mix of services when they come in. So I talked a little bit earlier about the shift in perception of work from home as not just being that benefit to the employee, but really a benefit to the, in, the agency as well. So that ability to work and be productive from anywhere is truly a benefit to the agency. So to focus back though for a second here on the employee benefit, studies have shown that employees report that they value flexibility and the greater control of their schedule that work from home typically affords them. So I will say from a GSA perspective, we are very fortunate that we've had the ability to work frequently from home, even pre-pandemic, but across the federal government as a whole, 
federal workers are now just getting to experience that value of telework. And the final guiding principle I wanted to share that we discovered is that there's certainly still challenges to overcome. So federal agencies pandemic response is starting to reveal these limits of present day technology. It's those challenges that range from practical things like connectivity problems to cultural things like work life separation, which is something I personally have really struggled with. In the future of federal work, physical and virtual workspaces alike will start to champion these values that the pandemic has started to place in relief. So thinking about human connections, cultivating trust, creating these serendipitous meetings that spark creativity, and then the organization belonging that permits employees to prioritize their own personal wellness. So through all of the Workplace 2030 conversations, what we decided is that GSA really needed to take a new approach in order to address the workplace challenges that have suddenly come to light. The GSA will shift from a mostly real estate focus to provide a mix of interrelated services. So providing technology, real estate, work support services that agencies and individuals need to adapt their work practices to these new ways of working. And over time, of course, these services will need to adapt as the nature of work and as our agency needs evolve. And of course, every agency's needs are unique. So the exact mix of the services will be driven by the way and also where these employees are doing their work. So in the future, some employees may work on site because their job requires it and others may work remotely full-time because their job allows it and also that they want to. And the rest of us may find ourselves in some sort of hybrid environment somewhere in between. Using our Workplace 2030 project as a forum, GSA and our customer partners will continue to co-create these expanded services to best support how an agency needs them. So more hybrid and more remote workers of the future will require more technology and additional work support services than traditional real estate. So I wanna shift here and for a few minutes talk about these new emerging services. So what we discovered is that in order to support this maintained increase in agency mobility of the future that we do anticipate coming out of the pandemic, we realized that we would need to create some new services and rethink other services. So through our Workplace 2030 project, our working group um, identified 15 new and some repurposed services that we're now launching teams to create, so making them into a reality. We're calling this overall collection of these 15 services a suite of service. So some of these may not end up coming to fruition, but others have emerged from conversations with our customers as being absolutely critical to assisting our customers with their future workplace support. So some of these services are brand new for the federal government. So for example, I'll talk here in a minute about home office in a box, something kind of out of the box for federal government perspective. It's not necessarily new to the industry, but it's new to us. Other services like our workplace standards are existing and just need to be rethought under this new current context of things we've learned. So again, I'll talk a little bit more about five of those services and where we've prioritized them. But first, I wanted to share a little bit of insight on our process to understand which services we first needed to focus our efforts and our time upon. So our team at Workplace 2030 examined three factors for each of those 15 services that I had on the previous screen. We looked at the overall impact to our customer agencies, so which services would have the greatest uh, results for the largest volume of our customers. And then we looked at speed, at which we could prioritize development of these services. And finally, we considered the ease of implementation. So which projects might we have to have quick wins and quick solutions ready to go for our customers. So we ranked these services and what we found is that five services emerged as having both the highest level of impact and the highest level of urgency. So the first service that has consistently risen to the top is the idea of the home office in a box. So our agencies have experienced that the effective home workplace is becoming this critical component to making successful telework work for 15 months. This home office in a box concept starts to support that idea 
that the home office is becoming this integral part of an agency's real estate strategy. And also that maintained high levels of telework post pandemic may mean the agencies can reduce their federal footprint. So this home office in a box emerging service is intended to establish a path that agencies can use to procure home office equipment and furnishings to ensure that employees have that equipment that they need to work most effectively and also very importantly, working ergonomically from an alternate work site. And the next concept is a workplace and technology showcase space. So this concept is intended to establish a working showroom type of environment for agencies to come and experience alongside of GSA to try out these emerging new technologies, new furnishings in an overall flexible and adaptive environment. So right now we're working to establish this concept space in our headquarters location at 1800 F Street in DC. We anticipate having that open and ready for agencies to experience later this fall. Of course, the timeline on that is truly dependent on when it's safe to get back into the workplace and get it set up. So then using space monitors, occupancy sensors, and other sensor technology, we can really start to better understand from a workplace perspective exactly which spaces are most utilized in order to adjust a space to be adaptive to how people are or aren't using the spaces. So this continuous feedback loop will allow us to adjust spaces over time to be more effective and more user friendly allowing us to make better and smarter space decisions and also to share feedback with our customers about which features and which spaces have been the most desirable. Of course, as we think about future workplace solutions, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about co-working. So co-working is a concept that's been around for about 15 years, but only is now starting to emerge as a viable real estate solution across the federal government. Through our Workplace 2030 Understanding and Discovery phase, federal co-working has consistently risen to the top, again, as that real estate strategy that could help realize significant cost savings by sharing expensive spaces across federal agencies as appropriate. So instead of duplicating these expensive build-outs across each and every agency, some of these spaces could be shared, ultimately saving taxpayer dollar. So GSA is looking to pilot what we're calling a flex hub space, where spaces and amenities can be shared across the federal agencies as needed, using the overall concept of space as a service or pay as you go type of environment. So we're looking to pilot this in conjunction with that workplace and technology showcase space that I've already mentioned. And assuming that we find success with this concept and also Assuming the demand outside of the DC market does exist, what we could do is open up GSA Flex Hub or co-working spaces within federal locations across the country and other cities. So this would allow agencies to use space as a service as needed. And just simply knowing that an alternate work site would be available at the drop of a hat could allow agencies to have that flexibility and also give them the confidence to be able to reduce their footprint, knowing that they had a space to go. This would dramatically open up workplace and work site flexibility for traveling federal employees as well. And then finally, of course, in order to make this shared environment, this flex hub concept successful, a work support app that's readily accessible across all federal agencies is critical. So this work support app could let agency employees log in and find and reserve workspaces or conference rooms at a nearby Flex Hub site. They could use it to even locate fellow coworkers who would be occupying the site on the same day. So this overall work support app could be expanded over time to include ways for agencies to locate training resources or provide employee health support benefits and other opportunities for networking across agencies. So then concurrently, I wanted to also note that as we're working on projects to turn those five emerging services and then others that kind of start to, to come into the same group, um, we're also just now kicking off phase two of our Workplace 2030 project. So phase one was that study and that understanding phase. Phase two will start to continue 
to build upon existing Center for Workplace strategy processes for engaging with our customers. So our Center for Workplace Strategy, both in the regions and central office, we frequently work with agencies on workplace engagements to understand their agency needs, to develop and establish tools with agencies to create and design more effective workplaces, and really to think more holistically about an agency's workspace and how it supports the federal worker. So through phase two of our Workplace 2030 project, we'll begin working on a series of engagements specifically within GSA space, but also looking to engage with other customers as well. So as we begin working on these initial projects with our customers and at GSA, we can create case studies that can be used to showcase these innovative and effective solutions. And then finally, you know, as we start to engage with our customers throughout the life cycle of their space occupancy, we'll find more value in that rather than simply coming to an agency on a periodic time when their leases are getting ready to expire, really having that data-driven ongoing relationship with our customer over the full term of the occupancy is going to allow GSA and our customer to truly be better partners and work together over time to ensure that their workspaces remain adaptable as new technologies and new practices emerge. And then of course, as agency missions evolve, we can help them be more flexible to respond. So with that, I wanted to see, it looks like we've got just a couple more minutes possibly um, for questions. So see if there's anything in chat, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, thank you. Um, first question, what kind of furnishings are you looking to provide in this home office in a box concept? Yeah, so I will say for all of the emerging services, but specifically for home office in a box, we're in the early stages of making them a reality. So right now we're still establishing what that furniture might be. Um, but right now I've got a running list of all these furniture pieces that agency employees might need. So, you know, top of the list, of course, is that ergonomic chair, making sure that they're not sitting in a wooden chair day in and day out. It's absolutely critical, as you all know. Um, thinking about adjustable height work surfaces and monitor arms and um, storage solutions, task lamps and things like that. So it runs the gamut. Um, and at this point, we don't know exactly and we don't have that aligned on what furniture it would specifically be. But really thinking at this point, we're just brainstorming on how to, what hurdles we need to cross and what we need to be able to provide. Well, um... Okay, thanks for that. And then about your emerging services, can you estimate when each of these services will be available to customers? Yeah, that's, um, it, that is something that everyone, including everyone at GSA wants to know. Including this morning, I had a conversation with someone who was saying that our home office in a box concept was years out. And I will say it is not years out. It is um, as soon as possible and Truly, I want to make sure that each and every one of those concepts that I talked about in more detail, but even the ones that I didn't touch on of the 15, we're trying to make them all a reality as soon as possible. Because through the full Workplace 2030 uh, discovery phase, we learned that there's so many different services that would support the way agencies are working. We really want to you know, be that support for them. So timeline on that, I will say that our Workplace Innovation Lab, including that Flex Hub concept of co-working, um, is anticipated to be up and running in the fall. Again, that is dependent on when it's safe to get back to the workplace, but we've got the steps out laid to get that space ready to go in the fall of this year. And the Workplace in a Box, Home Office in a Box, excuse me, is something that we're getting going as soon as possible. And I really don't know if that's three months out or six months, but it's certainly not years. Okay, thanks, Jane. And there's some energy and excitement about the showcase at 18th and F Street. Um, what can folks do? They seem very energized about being a part of that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I guess if you want to be a part of it from a furniture vendor perspective, we are looking to do bailment agreements with furniture vendors to provide furniture in that space for about a year period that agencies and GSA could experience and test out and provide feedback. So I will say if you are interested in participating as providing furniture for that space for a one year period, you can reach out to me. So my 
contact info is up there on the screen. Also, just a general email address is workplace, workplace at gsa.gov. And um, so we can collect your names. If the interest is more in just wanting to see the space, we first are prioritizing the customers to experience the space, but certainly we want to open it up to industry as well. And so we may be able to certainly schedule tours of the space when it is up and running. Um, and we also might have a virtual tour available if you're not located in the DC area or can't travel. Okay, and that email again was, because we could put that in the chat yep. for you. Yeah, it's workplace at gsa.gov. Terrific, okay. All right, thanks for that. This is a slightly broader question. Um, I guess in the news, people are hearing what the administration might be saying. And um, folks might be hearing that the new administration is setting a 25% max threshold for federal agency workforce occupancy in federal office space. Um, the question, is this true? And how do you see this impacting PBS? So I, in all honesty, I am so busy at work, I don't have time to watch the news. <laughs> Um, I should know the answer if that's true or not, but I don't. So 25%, I don't know. Um, I have a similar rumor, but I, I don't have any sort of basis on that. Um, but as agencies are thinking about how to return safely to the workplace, if that's 25% or 15%, whatever an agency is doing, um, GSA does offer a return to workplace services contract. And, you know, we've broadcast this to customers. Um, and so hopefully customers are aware that this contract is out there and can help them understand kind of their capacity within their workspace and also that demand. So understanding which groups of people have that priority to be in the workplace in that first phase. So if we can only put 25% of the people in there, who makes that cut to be that 25% and you know who will continue working from home for a longer period of time until it's safe to return. Okay, thanks, Jane. And then um, about the home office in a box, I'm not sure if you guys are there yet, but someone asked, would a home office in the box be able to include multiple manufactured products or do you see it just being one manufacturer for the different components? Yeah, I'll say at this point, it's too early for me to know the details of that, but um, the idea would probably not to just select one vendor and provide, you know, that vendor's chair and that vendor's table and task lamp. Um, I think that it will be more broad, but again, it's too early to know exactly how that will work. If we'll be providing furniture using stipends, whether that's creating a website where employees can log in and kind of pick from say five or six different chairs that they want. Um, so ultimately I'll say it's too early to know keeping everything um, on the table at this point. All right, well, that's a wrap on the questions. Thanks so much, Jane. All right, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. So folks, next up, we're going to host our first manufacturer spotlight of the day. Um, Many participants that joined us last June for QPC uh, may remember this spotlight segment. We introduced it last year, um, really just to you know, give small businesses an opportunity to, to shine. Um, we did not, these two, we have two small manufacturing spotlights today. Um, how, how did we choose these two? Um, when we first sent out registration to all of our suppliers, we offered in the application process to apply for this spotlight. Um, so we were able to select two. The first spotlight you're gonna watch is Seeding Concepts Inc. Um, you see their GSA contract number on there as well as their point of contact. Um, Seating Concepts Inc. is an American-based manufacturing company. They specialize in high-performance furniture for restaurant and food service. They were founded in 1980 and they operate their manufacturing in Rockdale, Illinois. And please, as you watch this video, think about contractor team and arrangements. Maybe you're a large business that might consider something like this as a, as a partnership to fulfill a requirement. So let's watch. Thank you. 
Terrific. Thanks to Seeding Concepts for submitting that video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll leave this up for a moment um, in case you want to write down their information or don't worry, we're going to send these slides so you'll have it. Um, yeah, okay, so next up, we're going to jump right ahead here. Uh, we've got Meg Sutliff uh, talking about an extremely hot topic, economic price adjustments. Um, Meg, are you ready? All right. You're on mute, Meg. Yes, I'm on mute. How many times do I do this a day, right? <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Meg Sutliff. I'm, I'm the, uh, well, well, now I'm the um, co-lead for the uh, br branch chief with um, Sean Kelly, um, at, least, at, at least for the next uh, 22 days. Um, um, and uh, today we want to uh, provide an overview of, of uh, the EPA clause and the processes set, uh, surrounding requests for EPAs and hopefully provide some um, insight as, as to the limitations within the clause and also where, where we can provide some, some uh, flexibility. Um, so Chris, Chris Stein created the start and I think she, uh, this, this slide and I think she did a great job at it, which uh, synopsizes the EPA clause 552-216-70, which under normal circumstances, this chart in and of itself would, would suffice. Would, uh, suffice. However, based on uh, like, uh, the current market conditions today, um, I think it would be helpful to understand what areas we may be flexible, as I said, and also how industry can help us with that as, as well. Um, so, so just for our purposes today, I wanted to mention that we'll be discussing the EPA clause that, that uh, predominantly applies under the furniture and furnishings category when the prices are based on, on, on a uh, commercial catalog. And that would be uh, GSAR 552.216-70 alternate one. Um, specifically, uh, uh, the limitations within the clause are um, obviously, the 10% cumulative increases within a 12 month period, which I know is a huge topic right now. Um, also, no more than three EPA re requests per a 12 month period. No EPA modification within 60 days prior to the end of the contract period. And then also the definition of the contract period. Does it refer to the entire 20 year contract or to um, base period and option periods in, individually? Um, and it's the latter, you know, but I, 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 I can explain the, uh, uh, the uh, like a reasoning later on. Um, so so uh, first let's uh, talk about the monetary 10% 10, 10 limitation. So it's been our centers and in, in interpretation that the language uh, like within the EPA clause allows contracting officers the, uh, the authority to to approve reasonable, and I stress reasonable requests over the 10% ceiling for, uh, for um, contracts when, when the market conditions apply. And the paragraph shown on the chart here, uh, C, um, get, uh, gives us that um, authority. Uh, the government uh, reserves a right to, to erase the ceiling when, when market conditions during the contract period support such a change. Um, but but uh, just to ensure this, um, Office of Policy and Compliance, or OPC, had had a recently confirmed that uh, uh, this interpretation was what was uh, correct uh, on a call recently, and and uh, there is a training scheduled for the end of this month for the entire ac acquisition workforce. Um, so then. Uh, um, Everything that I'm talking about, I did. I did confirm with with OPC that they're not going to come out and change something uh, the uh, the end of this month. That's not to say that they won't put some additional parameters around our procedures behind the scenes. But but everything that I'm telling you um, has been vetted through the Office of our Policy and and our Compliance as, as well. Um, and I did just want to mention a reasonable request uh, specifically. So uh, and the vast majority of EPAs 
that we have seen have been reasonable requests. And that, and that would include percentages that are based on, uh, on uh, some of the market indicators that, that uh, we've seen increase, um, particularly like you know, steel and wood. You know, um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a recent EPA um, that, uh, that I just saw yesterday. And it came in for um, percentages increase from, from a 2% to, to a 42% with a detailed um, explanation, especially for those products that came in at the 42%. Yeah, I, like in this one instance, they were steel cabinets, um, steel uh, uh, buildings, um, tor tornado shelters, which, which contain 98% steel. Um, in addition, it, it, it every, they uh, require wood, wood pallets for a shipment. Two of the largest things that like, that are impacting price today, and, um, and so of course, of course, that was a reasonable request. Um, as I said, the the vast majority of uh, EPAs that we've seen have been reasonable requests. But one one that that uh, sticks out in my mind, and it wasn't exactly an EPA modification, but it was somebody coming in saying, "I'm going to have to increase my prices like one or two hundred percent just because everything is increasing." You know, and I understand. Uh, uh, the uh, the issues that industry is uh, facing today, but you know, um, like uh, we need to kind of break it down um, as as well. Um, I think this is important to note too: is that is that is that documentation supporting the the, the reasonableness of uh, the price increase is is a requirement in all e EPA requests per per a paragraph D three of of the clause, regardless of the percentage of 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 um, increase requested. Um, so, so are these requests that 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 have been coming in over over the ceiling um, should should include additional information and more detailed documentation, such as like like uh, what are the market indicators? Uh, like uh, show us quotes where you have seen where the where the uh, increases have been sub substantial. Copies of invoices. You know, um, um, even if you uh, like uh, we had somebody say. Here's the invoice that I received last year at this same time, and here's the invoice now. You know, um, like uh, basically, I'm saying, like in other words, the amount of documentation should be kind of commensurate with the percentage of increase that 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 you have requested. And the next slide. So, um, since the EPA clause does uh, limit the number and uh, and the, uh, the frequency of EPAs per per item, uh, providing us a, like a percentage of the overall e, EPS um, EPA doesn't really help us at at, at all. Um, but but uh, what is helpful is is a breaking down the number of items that, that are affected by X percentage, the number of um, products that are affected by like you know or I like, guess uh, the EPA request is 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 a uh, requesting this this uh, percentage um, corresponding the uh, EPA percentage request to to uh, the products um, is extremely useful information for the specialist and and, and, the, con and the contracting officer <clears throat> excuse me allergies have been terrible and I keep losing my voice here um, I don't want to spend a, like a, a lot of time discussing the benefits and the value of using the price proposal template. I know I talked about this a little bit at, at, at uh, the CGP um, session last, last month, and, and this is going to be discussed in, in, in a more detail in the catalog management session. But just for information as it pertains to the EPA modification request uh, process, I did want to mention it. Um, COs, in addition to performing a vertical price analysis for, for each, each EPA modification. They also perform a horizontal price analysis. Uh, the first step in this um, is, um, in this analysis is a use of, of the 4P tool, which, which provides us with an automated market research report, but it requires the use of, of, of the price proposal template. So like, a, like, which is very important for us. So in some cases, we may need to do additional market research, but the 4P report all automates a, a large amount of that, of that market research 
for for us, and, and it enables us to process the modifications much much quicker. Uh, as as uh, Sean was pointing out on on IWAX uh, uh, mod metric slide. And I probably should have put this first. Discussion with your contracting officer is 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 a most important. You know, um, while we're while we're, we're also doing our due diligence behind the scene and looking at market indicators, um, at, at analyzing percentages of, of increase for certain raw materials, creating analyses and, uh, and justifications for, for a, fair, a fair reasonable pricing, um, and sharing these analyses across the other teams and, and, and uh, branches. We, we, we do this as a, a way to streamline the process. However, like we also realize that industry knows this way better than we do. You know, they have a much better handle on 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 what in, like what is happening within this industry, and and uh, specifically for your products. So you just need to share that information with the contracting officers. And then, uh, next slide. Um, Unfortunately, um, there there isn't much much flexibility within the language of, of this clause, like uh, regarding the number of allowable EPAs per per, per year. It it is limited to three. Uh, the language in here doesn't give us um, flexibility or an ability to interpret it, uh, and, and interpret it other than we are limited to a three per per year. However, it does apply to each product. Not, not, not to the contract. So each each product on your um, um, on on, a, on on contracts are are allowed three e, up to three EPAs per year. And the next slide. Um, so for for the purposes of of clause uh, five fifty two 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 sixteen seventy for what we're discussing today, the base period. And each five-year option period are, are considered separate contract periods, and and um, op, option periods are are not guaranteed, so they are considered separate co co contract periods. Um, and of course, this you know we're like we're just not going to go ahead with our interpretation. So we 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 erase this question based on a recent um, request that came in. Um, and I believe that the uh, vendor support center may have, a, an individual at the vendor support center may have given some misinformation to to um to a, one of our industry partners. So so uh, we raised this question at at a recent weekly call that we have. There, there's a subject matter experts and a representatives from all the centers um, and all the uh, port, portfolios across all all of the categories. Um, and these calls include the Mass PMO and also Jeff Calhoun's Solicitation Management Office, um, just to discuss things like this, like uh, what is everybody's interpretation? We're now under one solicitation, and so we want to make sure that that um, to the maximum extent that we can, that we're providing consistency across the various centers um, and, uh, and portfolios. So. Um, so so uh, we did raise this question, and, and the consensus is that the base period is a contract period, and each subsequent five-year option period is is its own co um, co contract period. Um, and also, no, and and Office of Policy and Compliance are also on these calls. And so, knowing that there has been some ambiguity in uh, the clause, one thing that OPC will do be before the clause is able to be updated because of that, because that'll take a substantial amount of time. Um, o, OPC will include this definition for contract period in a, a frequently asked a, a, asked question on the Mass PMO hub, I believe, and it'll be for the acquisition workforce and also in the portion that is for uh, the vendor um, facing site as, as well. And also we can share this um, um, as soon as that is, um, issued. And then next slide. Um, okay, so as so so EPA modifications will will only be um, considered if they were um, like I requested prior to a uh, sixty days prior to the end of the contract period. So so uh, let's just talk about this for a second. So ideally, 
once once uh, the option modification is issued at, and and the 210 day letter is 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 um, generated, a contractor responds uh, uh, like with all required documentation at the 165 day mark, and the specialist jumps on it right away and begins a process of processing the required steps in exercising an option, and all of that rarely happens. Um, and uh, and uh, we know that. It, it has been a, a, a tough a tough 15 or 16 months but even more so for industry so um, <clears throat> we've had to kind of um, track down um, it it's been a, like a little bit tough to get this uh, option in, in, in information timely and also for our acquisition workforce who who has uh, whose whose workload is just on a constant uptick? Um, one point that I want to make is that we're required to exercise options, and it's a FAR requirement, at least thirty days prior to the contract end date. So there are so many steps that need to be completed by by the specialist and, and a contracting order um, officer in order to exercise the option. So say if during this process, say if um, Say if we receive, it, uh, receive an EPA modification, um, once once say the specialist has like completed all almost half of those uh, actions, um, it may not be possible in order for the contract specialist and contracting officer to process that um, EPA modification and then and then redo what was already done for the option mod and and uh, still exercise the option timely or worse yet there's a lapse in contract coverage. Um, however, um, here's one place where, where uh, we have been, been uh, flexible or interpreting the uh, clause language to a way that it, that, that it makes sense. Like, 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 you know, we're making better business uh, decisions here. Um, paragraph B3 of the EPA clause states, increases are uh, requested before the last 60 day, days of uh, the contract period requested so if you let us know that hey i also have an epa coming up or or i was planning on doing the and and epa next year in our minds that counts as as um um you had let us know that you know and um and so epas may be required but again check with your contracting officer um an example of how we do this really on a regular basis is when a company establishes a pattern of EPA requests that 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 it coincides with the regular commercial catalog um, updates. We know that every year, company A comes in with an EPA request in May and in November. Um, so, so what we're not going to say, oh, okay, but for your first twelve months of of option period two, well, you're not allowed to submit like an EPA, that just doesn't make sense, you know? So, so, so again, uh, we are trying to be um, flexible with this. We, we really do understand uh, uh, the issues that, that industry is having and, and we're really trying to interpret it in a way that it, um, that um, we're able to be flexible, but then also remain compliant uh, like within the requirements of uh, the contract clause as well. And so I hope this session has answered some of your questions and um, it, and if not, if you have any questions, please I feel free, Sean and I can answer those now. All right, thank you, Meg. Um, let's see what kind of questions we have. There has been a few questions and it's just a repeat of the same question. A few people want to know um, if there's an alternative to submitting an economic price adjustment. They're wondering, can they assess a temporary surcharge to customers? Um, they're also wondering, would GSA ever raise the 10% maximum? So um, um, would a surcharge be an alternative to an APA? No, um, surcharges, <clears throat> and, excuse me, and 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 we have allowed them in, in in the past, but but surcharges would be included as a part of that vendor's EPA and um, allowance. Um, surcharges have been allowed in in in, in the past. Um, 
um, especially if that company has um, is is if that's how a company is uh, dealing with with an increase due to market conditions in their in their commercial business. Um, um, We've had it. Uh, there's there's uh, pros and cons with this. And first, you should absolutely discuss this with your contracting officer. Um, I think another uh, pro to this would be the fact that um, um, in, in the event that an EPA was temporary, say if it was like it's like a temporary condition, which most of the conditions that we've seen increasing are not are not decreasing just as fast or 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 as quickly. But say if it was just a temporary increase, so it's easier for for a vendor to um, just uh, remove the uh, surcharge, and you know in, instead of coming out with a whole other um, updated catalog. However, a con to it, I, I I think I wouldn't be as as a as a readily agreeable to it now because of the uh, pushback that we've had from customers. Um, customers really frown on 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 the use of surcharge, and I think it's just strictly due to optics, you know, because like they feel as though that they're being charged, charged like, you know, like, a, like an additional percentage by, by a company A over, over company B who does not list a surcharge, you know, so, but, in it, but the short answer would be no, um, a temporary surcharge is not an alternative to an EPA. It would just be part of your EPA. Okay. And then um, real quick, we got to squeeze this one in. Um, would, would GSA raise that 10% maximum? So, so there would not be a need to, to uh, raise the maximum because of the fact that we already have the flexibility um, in place to, to um, increase that um, as, as, a, as a need be. Um, there's a, a, but, I, but like having said that, um, I do believe that they are in the process of, of redoing the, the um, e, EPA clauses, but it's probably two years away. You know, it's, uh, there's a whole rulemaking process and a, and, and a changing a GSAR clause. It includes a business case analysis, vetting through various levels, presenting to the equivalent of a FAR cancel, opening up for public comment, a solicitation refresh. So um, it's easier to do it this way. And, and it's not necessary because of the fact that the contracting officers um, have the authority. Okay. All right, well, that's a wrap on EPAs. Thanks to Meg and Sean for, for this informative segment. Um, appreciate it. Next up, we're gonna hear about the Air Force and their furniture program with Mark Boris. Mark? Give me just a second. And where's the cursor? So hopefully you can see the slides now. Looks great. Um, I want to want to say hello to everybody. Um, it's been a couple of years since uh, the Air Force spoke last, and uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to let you know how things have progressed and uh, moved on the Air Force side of the house. Um, today we'll look at the fact that we've. Uh, in our case with furniture, we've gone in heavily into category management with 6.3. We'll take a look at our active and our developing programs, some potential future actions, and hopefully give everybody a few takeaways. So as I say, the Air Force um, kind of led the way in the Department of Defense on adopting OMB's uh, category management program. And uh, it took such great hold with us that uh, the gentleman in charge of category management is Mr. Lombardi, who is the Secretary of Air Force MB. So it's a two letter up at the Pentagon for the Air Force. Um, and he has uh, managed to get category managers assigned to most of the categories now. Um, furniture was assigned and Mr. Guadarrama acts as our category manager. Um, one of the pressing guidance for those of us doing strategic sourcing and category management is savings in the rate process and demand areas of the uh, equation. For our active programs, 
we since the last time we were in, we have managed to award our office seating two contracts, our BPAs, um, in late December of 2019. Um, it it uh, went, is going well. Um, in 15 months, we've we've purchased more than 27,000 chairs and spent 6.1 million. Now to the Air Force side of the house, that equated to a 20% savings on chairs. And we've done it while being 100% small business set aside. And we're utilizing Air Force Advantage, which is tied to GSA Advantage, but it's a subset for our strategic programs within the Air Force. Um, our companies are doing well. Um, we're getting ready to go into our second end of year season. Um, so we will see how this year goes compared to last um, and what effects COVID has on us. Our executive office furniture and conference furniture program um, expired on uh, EOCF1 and we put EOCF2 into play. Um, for EOCF2, we decided to piggyback on Navy BPAs in September of 19, making it a tier two program within category management. Tier zero means not controlled. Tier one is an agency specific contract where we're controlling. Tier two means it's a multiple agency. Um, we actually selected a subset of their uh, vendors um, and are using eight small businesses plus Unicor for our executive office furniture. In 18 months, we've spent 2.6 million, which is a significant decline for us. We had averaged maybe 10 million a year um, under the prior program. As you can see, we had 57 million spent over five years. Um, so we're, we're actually wondering as we get ready to, the, the Navy BPAs are expiring in September of 22, um, what we're gonna do is a follow on. Um, and for executive office furniture too, we did again use Air Force Advantage as those BPAs are written against GSA contracts. And I, I will say that one of the things we're, we're doing with executive office is uh, we're taking a hard look at with the lower dollars, whether it makes sense for us to have a program in this area um, down the road. Now, not all of our programs are acquisition um, defined, um, meaning that we, we won't necessarily write a contract or a BPA for things. Height adjustable stand-up desk converters were one of those areas where rather than do our own BPAs or contracts, um, we just issued a policy directive that the Air Force was to go to GSA and use their federal supply schedules. Um, we felt they would get as good a price reduction as, uh, as we would if we'd gone on our own. Um, and since that time, um, Ability One has now come out with a product and uh, we're promoting GSA ordering uh, using uh, Ability One's uh, program. Under our developing programs, we have system and modular two. We're currently in the market research stage. Um, this program has, was, we had a program, that program expired um, and we're now reassessing and, and trying to put together a new program. So we're doing market research. Um, it's been slowed down by trying to determine what effect COVID is going to have on the equipment and workforce in the future. Um, we have a general officer in charge of the, the uh, center that uh, is looking at the office of the future, as he refers to it, um, being much less in the way of cubicles like we have known them. Um, and more teleworking and that kind of thing. So we're trying to 
develop our requirements and figure out what we're going to do to accommodate that in the future. So recently, we just had an RFI go out to industry. I want to thank everybody um, that responded. Um, you've created quite a workload for me. Um, but we got over 100. We got over 100 responses from industry. It's going to take me a while to get through those. And then we'll use that response to try to, and all the other factors that we're, we're getting in our market research to try to set our requirements. And our goal is to try to make an award in 2022. Um, like I said, on executive office furniture, and we're, we're currently reviewing what's going to happen down the road. And that's going to take the, um, track of doing an opportunity assessment, um, trying to decide if uh, the reduced purchasing was strictly because everybody was at home and not in the office, or whether it's a, a new norm. So we'll look at that and, and try to make a uh, command decision on where we're going to go there. Future actions, uh, things to make you aware of. Um, it, if you remember, Tyndall Air Force Base a few years ago was wiped out by a hurricane. And I do mean wiped out. It basically, it went down to concrete slab in a lot of cases. Um, they've done a lot of work um, trying to redesign and rebuild Tyndall as the Air Force Base of the future. Um, we're getting to that point where some of the buildings are starting to go up, and as they go up, what happens? Well, when they get finished, they need furniture. So there's going to be multi-million dollars of furniture being purchased for Kindle. So you want to keep an eye out on SAM.gov and other places to try to see what's happening there. Um, another potential future action is we're contemplating the possibility of a packaged office solution for the Air Force. Don't know what form that'll take, um, but it's it's one that's being looked at. Um, it's one that uh, some of my interior designers are really pushing for. Um, we'll also take a look as we get through systems and modular and some of the other programs as do we need to look at any other furniture needs? We haven't identified any yet, but things like maybe hospital furniture, we'll, we'll need to put a program together. We, we'll know down the road. And then there's that pipe dream for potential future actions of uh, that we all want to work on. Um, Mr. Guadarrama really wants to work on getting away from fourth quarter ordering and uh, move demand to be a more planned action. Um, I tend to think that it's a great thing to work for, but personally, probably a pipe dream down the road. So takeaways, um, as you saw, the, the category management that we've done in furniture supports small business both executive office and seating or small business set aside programs. However, as we do larger strategic programs that are enterprise wide for the Air Force, means we come into some FAR requirements that are not normally in play and things that you may want to be prepared for um, as we do them. Um, a key player on our seating program was the fact that because the program had such a high dollar amount, it was initially estimated at 80 million over five years, um, we had met the threshold that we had to be compliant with the Barry Amendment. And for those of you who make chairs, uh, you know that uh, sourcing Fabric that's made in America is not as plentiful as it used to be. So if you've got a, if you've got furniture 
like systems and modular potentially um, that uses a fabric, you may want to start looking at domestic supply that could be on your program if you need to. Um, because we will, in, a, in our bigger programs, we will hit up on those kind of things. So there are DOD rules that uh, apply because of the dollar amounts that we're in. And I just want to reiterate something we always footstomp is that uh, we appreciate the RFI responses. Um, we try to make them, uh, and I won't say we did on systems modular because I know it was a biggie, but normally we will try to make them as easy as possible as we can, but the information we get back is critical for us to be able to develop an acquisition plan. For instance, if you are a small business systems modular manufacturer and you don't respond to the RFIs and I don't realize that you're out there, your number is not going to count as I try to evaluate whether or not I've got enough small businesses to set it aside for small business. So like I say, just take the time, at least make sure that uh, the folks that are putting in RFI know that you're interested um, and give us an RFI response if you can, even if it's only partial. Um, the other thing that I've been very surprised with with my chairs, and I wanna make sure everybody is uh, aware of, but you probably are, um, but you've gotta be ready for uh, government purchase card sales. Um, we tried to develop the ordering guide and we were we delved into how purchase orders would be done and things, but I've been very surprised on chairs. It seems like about 90% of the buys are GPC. So something that uh, you wanna make sure as a business that you're prepared to, to take care of credit cards. And at this point, I'll open it up for any questions. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. So your first systems and modular program, um, when did that actually end and, and why this break? Um, it actually ended in 2018. Um, and we had had some problems with the program, um, not with vendors um, supplying, but on our side of the house with a lot of folks that wanted to opt out of the program for various reasons. And so one of the things we're trying to do as we, as we develop the new program is look at all those waiver requests that had come in and try to figure out is there a avenue to cut down on that as we do the new award? And so we're, op we're, we're looking at, at things like opening it up to the full catalog if we can, but how can we get that structured price-wise and things to do that and not you know, take 100 days to do something. Um, so it was more internal than external um, but that, and then, like I say, with COVID hitting, it slowed down the process on, on getting this restart going because we didn't know where we were at. And like I say, I've got a general that thinks we're going to have an office of the future and a good portion are going to be out teleworking. And as I point out to folks, while there may be a portion of the Air Force that that is applicable to, I am still going to have offices that are inside vaults doing classified work that are probably going to be having normal cubicle requirements. So I've got to, I've got to work on an instrument that can do both. Um, the general only sees his big building down in Texas and all of the cubicle farms that are in it and then looks and sees that there's nobody in the office working. So we'll get there. It's just going to take us a little time. Right. And to that point, how much does the Air Force really think telework is going to impact 
the outcome of the systems and modular furniture program? I'm hard pressed to give an answer to that currently uh, because at the headquarters Air Force level, they're currently reworking our telework um, procedures so that when we're back off of the COVID situation, um, I will say that they know that there's going to be more telework because we have proven in some cases that we can be just as effective working from home as we are from the office. Um, but I think, I don't think anybody will go to 100% telework. I think we'll end up with a hybrid of some kind. Um, and so we've got a plan for housing for that hybrid. Okay. And one, one last question we have time for. Um, it's about using schedules. So Air Force buyers, is it okay for them to use schedules or should they only be using BPAs? For those areas that we have done strategic sourcing, executive office furniture and seating, they should only be using the BPAs, either the Air Force BPA in the, in the realm of seating or the Navy's BPA. Um, and they should be coming through that Air Force portal into uh, adva GSA Advantage um, because what that does, it allows me to structure it so that those folks that have the BPAs all get a chance to see the requirements. If I just went, here are the BPAs and you can use them because it's a decentralized world that I'm dealing in, I couldn't maintain the ability for a fair opportunity for all the vendors. By going through the portal, we can set it up so that the, the RFQ, they do one RFQ and it goes out to everybody that's a holder of the schedules or of the BPAs. Um, and that gives them an opportunity. Now they don't always choose to participate on certain ones, but they had the opportunity. Whereas if I just let the individual bases go, you know, it might be one out of 10 that was getting 95% of the requests for quotes. Okay. All right, I think that was extremely helpful. Thanks, Mark. Certainly. All right, Mark, so that wraps up your segment. Appreciate it so much. Uh, everyone, next up, we're gonna have another small business spotlight. This spotlight is on datum filing systems. You can see their information up there, their GSA contracts. We've got their point of contact. Um, data storage solutions, a team of in-house engineers and designers and skilled craftsmen have manufactured storage solutions for over 40,000 companies around the world. Datum's diverse line of products are made in York, Pennsylvania. Let's watch. I was only a little kid, so I was little. I just was there. <laughs> it happened around me. I didn't have any clue what was happening. As far as I knew, everybody had a little factory in their basement. I didn't know they did that. My father had an idea of a uh, like a Rolodex, what we know as today, of a little card file that would hold people's phone numbers and addresses and things like that. And, uh, we built the whole system in the house and uh, it turned out to be the, the the seed that started the whole company and we started off at the, with the company called being called desktop file company my father would advertise in uh, the back of the newspapers with a section called parade and you get a couple orders out of it and it just continued to grow. It was all in the basement. And finally, my father got fed up with the job and he was working on his full-time job. And he said, that's it. And he went full-time uh, with the, uh, uh, the business.
1989, my dad decided to retire. And my brothers and I, we said, well, we'd like to buy the business. So we bought the business from my father. And we were just growing so much on Long Island and we were running out of space and we needed to expand our facility. So we began a search through Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, and settled on York, Pennsylvania. We built our first factory in 1992, a 40,000 square foot facility, expanded that to 60,000 square feet, and eventually moved into this building where we are now in 2001, and now this building is nearly 200,000 square feet. Datum has had a long history of developing and manufacturing a very high quality product. And our aim continuously is to not only uh, design a high quality product, but also to uh, assure that the product is cost competitive in the marketplace, as well as delivering the products to our customers when they're expected. Datum has developed a very keen manufacturing process and we manufacture excellent products and we, we support that product with great personnel. We have salespeople who understand the product inside and out and can give you what you need. We're not going to tell you, here's how it works, make it work for you. We try to figure out what they need and we try to find the solution that best fits them, that gives them the best answer to what they're problem is. You can customize something to fit an exact requirement for some for a customer, whether it's making a unit exactly fit in the room, or making the shelves different size and configuration. Um, we have the ability to do that. We have a flexible machinery that we can do it with. We have flexible people that can understand what the needs are and put it on paper and get it delivered and assembled and the customers are happy. Data as a company is good as its employees, and we value them and we value their contribution to the success of Data. <laughs> All right, thank you Datum for su submitting that. And I think we're gonna put their information on the screen one more time, yep. All right, yeah, thanks to Datum. Um, that rounds out our manufacturer spotlights for today. Next up, we're gonna hear all about catalog management with Mike Shepard and Josh Voico and Peter Hahn. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Chris, appreciate it. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Mike Shepard. Uh, I am the program manager for GSA's newly established catalog management office. Um, certainly recognize uh, some of the names on this call. I uh, previously worked in a, a number of different roles in region three, part of which was time uh, in IWAC as a contracting officer and as a project manager. Uh, so it's, uh, it's nice to see some familiar names on the call today. Um, I think, uh, to echo some of what uh, Dina said at the at the jump here uh, in terms of catalog management and um, our recognition that uh, furniture represents some uh, unique variables uh, uh, in terms of the, the complexity of uh, furniture part numbers and configurations and the like. Um, so uh, we're excited to, to start a dialogue today in terms of um, some next steps there uh, as we build out our, our new catalog management environment. Um, in terms of an agenda, I'll give you the broad strokes of what our program is all about. Um, I'm going to hand to my colleagues, Peter Hahn and Josh Royko. Uh, Peter Hahn, uh, you may know from his time as the Region 2 Center Director. He brings um, some really important center expertise and perspective. Uh, he's going to speak to the Common Catalog Platform, a new 
uh, UI that will replace our legacy uh, catalog management tools, most notably SIP and CORES uh, out of the gate. Uh, and then he'll hand off to Josh who will uh, walk through the, the VPP. Josh, for those that, that don't know, has been with GSA for some time. He was uh, previously with the Office of Policy Compliance uh, and he really is a uh, one of the, the preeminent thought leaders uh, as it pertains to, to data management and catalog data management in particular across FAST. Uh, Josh will also be giving a, a demo on the new VPP now that uh, it's live and in production. All right, next slide. So some background here uh, on catalog management. So uh, we started uh, this initiative, Dina and myself, uh, two years ago now as a, an initiative. We've now grown into a formal catalog management office, which uh, I'm certainly excited about. Uh, in short, catalog management is about uh, improving uh, how we manage catalog data across uh, the 60 million odd item catalog. Uh, it does include both uh, products and services, albeit much of our focus out of the gate is on products and COTS products in particular. Uh, through our efforts, we're really focused on trying to deliver value for, for all three of the big three stakeholders. Um, we want to make it easier for our suppliers to manage catalog data. Uh, we certainly want to make it easier for our workforce to uh, analyze uh, that catalog data. And then ultimately, um, we, uh, we want to make uh, catalog information easier for our customers to navigate uh, and, and find the products they need uh, through our, our various e-commerce platforms. Uh, so uh, what are the, the problem areas we're trying to address here? Uh, this slide gives you a flavor for some of the, the more prominent pain points uh, that we hear about through various surveys. Um, 40% uh, of our suppliers are dissatisfied uh, with uh, the uh, SIP program. So we know that that is a, a chronic longstanding uh, problem child for us that we are endeavoring to address through our work. Um, we know that too, because we get 13,000 odd help desk inquiries related to catalog ingest and maintenance problems, which in turn has an impact on our acquisition workforce. So 90% of our surveyed workforce uh, from a survey that went out this fall uh, indicated uh, that they have been contacted uh, for assistance in, in loading and managing catalogs. Um, so there's a, a certainly a, a burden on our workforce, uh, an added effort there that um, we are looking to reduce in the context of our work. Uh, and then all of this has the net impact of delivering uh, data to our Advantage platform uh, that um, frankly uh, does not make our customers very happy. Uh, nearly half of our customers surveyed on the Advantage platform uh, indicate uh, dissatisfaction or high levels dis of dissatisfaction. Uh, you can see in some of those sub bullets that it's, it's not just about product photos, frankly. Uh, we see similar themes around product descriptions. We see similar themes around uh, inventory status uh, and, and around search functionality. Um, so what are we doing to, to try to fix all this? Um, so uh, this slide here captures uh, the new catalog management environment that we are uh, actively driving towards. Um, you see here three new catalog management systems. Uh, these catalog management systems are working in concert to um, deliver high, higher quality, uh, more timely data down to our customer tools, um, advantage being the, the focus, the primary focus uh, out of the gate. Uh, so Mark, uh, so Peter and, and Josh uh, are gonna speak to, to each of these, but um, real quickly on, on the left, over the top, you see the Com Catalog platform. Uh, the CCP is a new web-based tool that uh, we uh, are gonna very intentionally integrate with our contract writing system of record. Uh, to manage catalogs. This is a long desired replacement for um, SIP and CORES. Um, on the right hand side, you see the verified products portal, the VPP, which Josh will demo. This is an OEM wholesaler facing portal. So manufacturers and wholesalers uh, will use this portal to deliver uh, product content. Uh, and then in the middle here, you see the, the authoritative catalog repository. This is a, uh, a back end project. Um, uh, neither mass contractors nor manufacturers will access the ACR directly, uh, but the ACR is ultimately the data hub uh, that will uh, manage and, and deliver uh, catalog data to our, our downstream customer tools. Uh, 
Uh, so all three of these systems offer something different. And as I said, um, they, they work together to um, uh, deliver uh, uh, higher quality data, more compliant data, uh, more efficiently uh, than our, our current environment does today. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it off to, uh, to Peter now to talk through CCP first. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Hahn. So uh, I've been leading the uh, the requirements uh, gathering for our common catalog platform uh, uh, liaison with our our our, uh, our vendors, also with our, our internal workforce. Uh, we've done a couple focus groups, um, but uh, and then we you know, we look to do more. So uh, this is not going to be the last time you, you hear about this or uh, the last opportunity to to engage. Uh, the Common Catalog Platform, uh, or the CCP, as, as Mike mentioned, um, at its core, we're looking to replace our, our SIP uh, desktop application with a new modern web-based UI. It'll be API accessible. Um, it'll be our, our workforce um, will be able to access it as well. Um, so that, um, and it'll be uh, um, uh, something that uh, will address the, uh, the two-step process that we uh, often um, refer to, uh, where uh, the vendors and our workforce have to um, submit, review, um, and uh, ultimately approve that data twice, once during the contracting phase and then second during the catalog phase through uh, SIP or EDI. Um, so by integrating both our, our contracting and catalog process, um, we're looking to uh, combine the data sets from our SIP and our EDI data sets, as well as the uh, price proposal template uh, which is a uh, basically a spreadsheet that is used uh, during the contracting process for an offer or modification. By combining that process, uh, we thus address the uh, the two step and, and bring it down to to a single step. Um, uh, the other uh, features that we're looking to do with the CCP is to um, uh, by automating some of the uh, the business rules. Um, we, we're looking to um, uh, basically create like a wizard where a vendor can uh, go in answer some questions and uh, it'll help configure the right price proposal template um, for you so there's uh, you know uh, less confusion about what you have to fill out um, and even uh, right now some of our, our, our products price proposal templates are kind of one size fits all we're looking to try to uh, make it a little bit more uh, custom made according to the industry or according to your offering um, other additional features are uh, the, the 4P. I um, kind of mentioned this earlier in the uh, in the uh, uh, meeting today. Uh, that's basically market research that is provided um, based on uh, some of your pricing, some of the uh, flags regarding an ETS or building one or things like that. Uh, we're going to be exposing that sort of same level of functionality and research to the contractor or to the offer and the vendor prior to you submitting your offer or mod. Um, that'll hopefully cu cut down on some of the back and forth. Um, and you'll be able to see that information um, uh, prior to and, and make some adjustments or address any sort of discrepancies or, or make some justifications on uh, where some of that is, is coming in. Uh, I think the other thing too is that um, by addressing the price proposal template as a uh, within the CCP, we're looking to also validate some of the business rules. Right now, a lot of like, for example, a lot of the formulas, um, you know, we'd have to manually review and check, make sure that uh, nothing was inadvertently or even purposely uh, um, uh, changed. Uh, the CCP uh, will validate a lot of those rules so that by the time you submit it, you'll get some confirmation that you've submitted it correctly or completely. Um, and uh, same with acquisition workforce as well. So that'll cut down on some of that administrative um, uh, timing as well. So let's go to the uh, next slide. So uh, by creating the CCP um, and again, integrating it with our, with our contracting process, it opens up some new uh, possibilities. Uh, for example, um, maybe not every uh, change or catalog change requires a modification. Some will still, uh, especially anything to do with pricing. Uh, but there are some things that uh, we feel that um, may not require a modification or contract modification. We'll create some business rules or processes um, um, to ensure that uh, we have a good process, but at the same time, it may not require contract modification. And thus, again, cut down on some of that um, administrative uh, burden. Uh, for example, photo updates, um, some uh, non-price related options, uh, some temporary removals. Uh, these are things that we're looking into um, with our policy uh, to, to make uh, effective um, once we roll out the CCP. The other thing too is that again, by integrating with our contracting process, temporary price reductions or even deletions or removal of items from, from the contract 
um, this will give you the tools to be able to manage your catalog a lot more efficiently. Some of these things, um, instead of waiting for a modification to be approved, uh, we're looking to make those things effective immediately and then either uh, generate a mod uh, to uh, make that, uh, 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 that contract action um, complete or um, approved. But some of these things, um, for example, you know, removing from catalog so that a customer can order something that's maybe not available or even a, you know, a temporary price uh, reduction in terms of a, a sale. These are things that we want to get uh, available to our, our customers as soon as possible. The bottom there also inventory management. Um, you know, and then of course with the CCP, we are looking to um, address every uh, line item that we can. We understand that the furniture industry um, um, uh, has some um, uh, special needs or, or special um, uh, issues that we need to address. And so um, I think we'll, we'll be working with the, with the region three um, uh, group here uh, to create a working group to address some of these things um, you know, with some uh, select vendors as well. And some things may not lend itself to be published to advantage. Uh, we wanna understand and, and do some deep dive on understanding like what, are, what are the right processes uh, to address uh, what should be published to advantage. Um, I think the CCP will, you know, likely address a lot of the, uh, you know, the COTS or um, easily identified part numbers. Um, you know, we understand there's other things uh, in the furniture product catalog that may not lend itself, uh, but these are things. These are things that we want to look into and, uh, and and see what is the right approach. Um, uh, I think the the other thing to mention here is that the CCP, as we roll this out, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, we are looking to address the MVP, the, the minimal viable product. We're gonna develop this in an agile software development way. Um, right now, uh, we are uh, June, 2021. We're about to issue an RFQ to our common BPA holders to uh, get a contractor to start building this CCP. Uh, we're looking to target an award by September um, and uh, looking to uh, roll out the mass phase one, uh, the MVP uh, toward the, the late, the latter part of FY22. So we're still, uh, you know, about a year's away uh, from actually seeing this operationalized. Of course, you know, as we get uh, better dates um, and more information, uh, we'll be um, uh, providing some of that. Um, and again, uh, we are looking to provide user um, uh, center design, human center design, both from our, our workforce, uh, our vendors, uh, we're all stakeholders and making sure that this process works. Um, so there'll be other opportunities for, for engagement on some of the design and some of the you know trickier parts of how do we want to build the, the CCP to, to make some of our objectives uh, a reality. Great, I think uh, next slide, I think I'll be turning it over to Josh at this point for the VPP. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Peter. Let me just pull it up and make sure everyone can see my screen still. Okay, so VPP is the first piece of catalog management architecture that is coming online. We're very excited about it because we think it has the potential to uh, solve some really longstanding challenges. The first is improving the buyer experience by eliminating variability um, and providing more consistent product representations. In addition to consistency, we think we can provide a richer uh, customer experience by partnering with manufacturers and wholesalers. I should underscore that it's a manufacturer and wholesaler facing portal. Uh, the goal is to collect information around um, product content and supplier authorization. I'm going to move through the slides a little bit quickly on VPP and save it for the demo as I think it'll hit home a little bit more. Uh, but the goal is to collect richer content, uh, collect supplier authorization information, and automate how we handle uh, letter of supply management and, um, and in, put in place some, some scrim controls as well. Uh, VP, uh, excuse me, VPP status. Uh, we launched the prototype in November of 2020 and onboarded a small number of manufacturers for testing to kind of understand um, was it working well, where the pain points, uh, and made a, a, a few minor tweaks to it. Uh, in May, we went forward with the full launch and we are still uh, ramping up. Uh, we have roughly uh, 30 participants so far uh, who have registered for accounts. Not all of them are loading content just yet, uh, but currently we have data um, for supplier authorization from uh, three manufacturers. And then we have product content from 875 manufacturers. And that uh, is also you know, 
wider because of the presence of wholesalers in that data set as well. Uh, in the coming months, we have some really exciting work going on about connecting VPP data directly from manufacturers and wholesalers to augment the data that's on GSA Advantage. And I'll, I'll give a quick before and after during the demo that I think will cover that. And then longer term, uh, in terms of what we're looking to do with supply chain, um, you know, we're, we're looking to bring in all of the data from VPP through the common catalog platform to make it transparent and to identify supply chain risk, um, you know, on a pre-award basis. Um, we're we're folding it into the 4P tool initially, but CCP is where it will really um, start to leverage the full power of the VPP. So let me cover ACR quickly. ACR, um, it's it's something that you know you probably won't see. It's really an internal back end tool, uh, but it's really the backbone of catalog management. It brings everything together. Currently, if you look at how product content is stored uh, for awarded items, it's in varying formats um, as kind of attachments to the contract file. We're looking to standardize the formats for at least COTS product. Um, and you know, through the CCP, um, create this one-step process that allows us to eliminate SIP and cores, which improves catalog processing time, increases accessibility, increases accuracy, uh, and, and really modernizes how we do catalog management as, as an organization. Um, so ACR is uh, undergoing active development. We are getting pretty close to the full uh, proof of concept, which is due at the end of FY21, but it's really the prep work that's necessary for us to begin uh, the, the front end work with the common catalog platform. So ultimately, um, these tools, the impact to the customer is we'll have much better quality in terms of photos and descriptions, uh, potentially PDFs, videos, things of that nature. Uh, the speed at which um, we can get data loaded to advantage will be much quicker and it will be much more flexible uh, and, and we can provide additional capabilities such as uh, supply uh, or stock status. So. I'm going to I'm going to jump into the demo here because I think it'll help a little bit more. Let me pull it up. So this is actually the VPP um, portal here, and you can see I have it filtered for Han. We have 1,529 Han products. I thought for this group it might be a, a good manufacturer to pull up. Um, and so you can see we're collecting information. Um, a product title, a part number, brand name. I think brand is a really key thing to touch on right now. If you look at GSA Advantage, brand isn't a field. And, and so if you think about from a customer shopping perspective, you know, a customer is likely to search for say glass cleaner. Uh, if, they're, if, they're, if they're doing that, they're likely to search for you know, Windex. They're probably not searching for you know, RB or Reckett Benkiser. Um, so the ability to collect and display brand name kind of alleviates the, the decision whether you know you have to provide you know, the literal manufacturer name or if the brand name is acceptable in manufacturer place and, and makes it easier for our customers to find what they're looking for. So product title, descriptions, um, I'm going to scroll down through this. Uh, so you know product images directly from the manufacturer or a major wholesaler. Uh, we can also collect PDF files, data sheets, videos, and, and just as a real world example, I wanted to show one item here just briefly. This is a screenshot of a listing on Advantage for a HP inkjet item. You can, you don't have to squint, squint to read it. You can kind of tell just looking at it. There's no image. The description is pretty short. It's HP 712, 29 milliliter magenta ink cartridge. So not very descriptive, not telling you what the yield is. Um, there's not a lot of information, not the type of shopping experience that you know, you hope to find on a modern e-commerce platform. This is a very crude mock-up that I did, and apologies, I'm not a graphic artist, of what it could look like on GSA Advantage. Uh, and it's, this is being actively developed um, with data that is live in VPP. And so here you see a really high quality image uh, directly from HP, a description directly from HP, a uh, PDF cell sheet that um, helps HP kind of get their value proposition out there. So. You know, they did a study that shows, sure, HP Inc. is more expensive than non-HP Inc., but if you use HP Inc., you go through print heads less often, and overall, the total cost of ownership is, you know, lower according to their study. I'm sure competitors have commissioned studies that come to different conclusions, but it's helpful to put this information out there for the customer to consider when making a purchasing decision. 
Um, definitely a much richer shopping experience. And one of my favorite things, I'm not going to play much of it, but the idea of having product videos. So again, due to due to time constraints, not going to play the video, but just wanted to kind of convey that that's you know, the type of content that we're looking to collect. Um, and I think will be really helpful, um, you know, in improving the customer shopping experience. So that's the product content side of BPP. In addition to product content, uh, we're collecting supplier authorization information. So, um, you know, you, you may have noticed the uh, mass solicitation uh, update last uh, last month, I think it was May 17th, uh, that formally um, made VPP the authoritative source uh, for supplier authorization and, and allowed us to use that data in lieu of a letter of supply. Um, so manufacturers can provide um, information about their authorized suppliers. Uh, if we have that data from a manufacturer, then no letter of supply is required. Um, if you do not appear on the list, however, we will be providing a flag within 4P and this is already live. Um, so if you're not on the list as authorized, uh, essentially you'd be deemed unauthorized. There's also an unauthorized status uh, really designated for uh, partners who were previously authorized but have subsequently been uh, deauthorized for whatever reason. Um, and, and the way this is conveyed to the contracting officer uh, is both through a dashboard and uh, the 4P report that you may be used to seeing. Um, and there's a new field in column C, um, requires letter of supply, essentially means we do not have data in VPP. So the status quo stands, you still need a letter of supply. Uh, unauthorized means that the contractor who has proposed this item does not appear on the list of authorized suppliers from the manufacturer who has provided data to VPP. And then uh, the final status is authorized. And we have a nice note that lets the contracting officer know a letter of supply is not required for this item because we have information from the manufacturer or major wholesaler that tells us that they are authorized to distribute this product um, and a letter of supply is no longer required. So it should streamline the process. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on uh, within VPP is, let me pull this up, product content. Um, so we have the ability to collect data on um, prohibited products. So for example, you know, non-TAA products. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and select that. So we're, we're looking to partner with manufacturers and wholesalers to collect not just the government items, but the items that are sold commercially so that we know which items are manufactured in China, India, Russia, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, all the non-TA compliant uh, countries so that we can you know, alert the contracting officer so that we have kind of a level playing field and we can ensure enforcement of non-TA and also help you remain compliant as well. Uh, sometimes production shifts, so your data may show as TA compliant we may have updated data that shows production has shifted to a non-TA compliant country. So um, that's it for the VPP demo. I did want to highlight quickly that we also have a VPP participation dashboard. You can see who's participating in terms of supplier authorization as well as product content. Again, you can see 875, if you scroll down through here, looks like I've timed out um, since I loaded it, but you can go to the, the website here uh, and view who is participating in VPP and this dashboard is updated on a weekly basis. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to uh, Mike Shepard to wrap us up. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so just to bring us home, uh, again, you know, we, uh, we certainly recognize as we build to this new catalog management environment that there are unique considerations um, in, in, uh, in the furniture space, uh, some of which we, we hit on. Um, so we, we are looking to establish a working group here. Um, so we'll be working with IWAC BD to um, send out a, a request for volunteers to, to work with us. Um, you see uh, a handful of areas where we know we need to, to do um, a deeper dive, you know, what uh, should a furniture price proposal template look like um, in the future here? Um, how can we manage some of the part number uh, configuration complexity, um, particularly with systems furniture? 
um, and um, uh, some highly customized solutions that are uh, specific to a, a, a floor plan and a, a unique bill of materials. Um, so, uh, as I said, we'll be working with IOAC BD to uh, request volunteers to, to uh, work with our group. Um, in the meantime, um, if you're not already a member of our Interact page, would, uh, would love to have you join us there uh, on the Interact page. Uh, we provide pretty, pretty uh, regularly cadenced updates there in terms of our, our, our uh, project and the, the various um, uh, products that, that we covered today. Uh, and you can email us. We have a common inbox. Cot catalog management comes to me, comes to the other folks uh, that, that briefed with me today. Uh, for VPP specifically, we also have a, a separate um, email uh, there, vpp at gsa.gov. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's our presentation today at this point. Uh, Becky, maybe we can just open it up to any um, questions from, uh, from the community here. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Thanks, Mike, Peter, and Josh. We do have a couple questions for you guys. First question we have is about SIP. Is there a timeline for getting rid of it? I'll take that one. So I think uh, with the common catalog portable, the, the CCP, uh, we're looking to get that um, implemented by late FY22. So about a year from now, a year plus from now. And it's not going to happen overnight. You know, we have 13,000 vendors, a lot of contracts that support that. Um, so there's going to be a transition process. Um, we're going to have to work um, on that uh, transition plan. And so we'll be in touch about how that actually will happen and affect uh, each each vendor. But of course, our, our goal is to get rid of uh, get rid of SIP in that in that process and uh, integrate that with our contracting process. So it may take a little bit more time um, once we start implementing and rolling it out. Um, but that's our timeline for now. Okay. And it, so. Um, when do they start using the CCP then, or completely don't know? Yeah, we, we don't know at this point. I mean, we're, we're projecting a year from now when it'll, it'll be operational, uh, but then we'll have to come up uh, with a transition plan to work with each vendor and in, in, in category and industry about how they will be impacted. Okay. And then one more question. Um, are these furniture vendors going to be expected to um, submit detailed catalog information for all of their offerings? I think that's the uh, what the working group is is looking to try to address. I think our, our goal, uh, not just for furniture, but for all of our catalogs in, in GSA, is to get every line item in the ECR uh, through the CCP. We realize that uh, at a jump that may not happen um, at the uh, MVP. So we'll work over time on what makes sense. Uh, but that's what the working group will will uh, do a deep dive and, and and do some discovery on. Yeah, we certainly understand that there are some um, you know nuances to the way the the furniture industry does business, particularly around configurable products. Um, so it's something that likely would be a, a later phase, but something that we're actually looking at and, and, and want a partner to figure out the best way to approach it. But I do think the goal is to collect that information, but not to force it into, you know, a, a template that doesn't, you know, or that's not conducive to that, that approach. All righty. Well, thanks to Mike, Peter, and Josh. Uh, appreciate the presentation today. Next up, everyone, we're going to hear from Deb Ebley talking about small business. Deb. Uh, oh. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about the little delay there. Uh, thank you so much to the QPC for inviting me uh, to talk about small business. So let me share my screen. And it's going a little slow for me. I apologize for that. Jeez. Have no fear. All right. Well, it's giving it a shot here. It's not happening, Chris. Can you pull up my slide deck for me? Yeah. Give me a second. One sec. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was there earlier. <laughs> Yeah, you're rounding it out as our last formal speaker. Of course. Before our, <laughs> before, our um, before, before our breakout session. Anyway, right. uh, already, let me share my screen. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it.
Okay, so how do we? How can you help small businesses and the United States economy? And primarily, I'm going to talk about small business subcontracting plans. So this is really directed towards our prime contractors who are considered other than small business, if you will, or large business. But for those of you who are small businesses, if you outgrow your size, you need to understand the requirements for small business subcontracting plans so that when you are required to submit a plan, you will understand why and how it all fits into the US economy. And, and you actually know probably more so than any of us. Next slide, please, Chris. All right. So the impact uh, that small business has on the United States economy, boy, if COVID-19 didn't tell us uh, or tell all of us as American taxpayers, I don't know what else did. I'm sure all of you actually supported your small businesses in your local towns to make sure that they are thriving and still in existence. Well, guess what? One of the beauties of federal government contracting is that you can support small business in your everyday job. Um, and to foster those opportunities for small business. Um, also, just to let you know too, because of the impact of COVID-19 and, and drawing attention to, to what happened during co this past year, uh, the White House, of course, has earmarked small business as one of the priorities, as well as equity. So we're still waiting to see what is going to come out of it, but in the meantime, we have small business subcontracting plans that have been around for more than 40 years. Uh, and in the last couple of years before COVID-19 hit, testimony in front of Congress, small business subcommittees and what have you has garnered an interest government wide in how small business subcontracting plans are being administered after a uh, contract award. Because if you can't set aside, if the government cannot set aside a prime contract for a small business, we have to ensure that dollars get into small businesses subcontracting hands. And the way to do that is through these subcontracting plans. GAO, it was also interested, in fact, Congress directed them to take a look at a couple of agencies, which they did in 2019. They looked at two Department of Defense agencies uh, in administering subcontracting plans, and they looked at two civilian agencies, one of which was GSA. Uh, but I have to say, because of GSA leadership commitment, we came away with one finding, uh, as opposed to some of the other um, agencies that were reviewed. And GSA commitment from the administrator, uh, regardless of which administration is in office, uh, that commitment came from the top for the last couple of years. So, and that trickles down to the regional commissioners as well as to the contracting directors and to our contracting officers. Next slide, please. So the first thing you need to do is, and to try to revitalize, if you will, small business subcontracting plans, because maybe some of you are saying, you know, and I'm getting a lot of questions right now, what's going on? Um, and we want to point you in the right direction so that you understand. Like I said, this has been around for a long time, but government-wide, we haven't done a good job with small business subcontracting plans, either negotiating maximum goals up front or administering the subcontracting plans after award. So there are two clauses that are in your contracts, and we're going to take a look at them. And the first one is 52.219-8, Utilization of Small Business Concerns. And that outlines the statutory requirement, the policy of the United States government that says that small business, small disadvantaged business, women-owned small businesses, veteran-owned small businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, and hub-zone small businesses will have the maximum practicable opportunity to participate as subcontractors, as well as prime contractors, um, and contractors, which we'll see what the language is shortly, contractors agree to implement this policy to the fullest extent. The second clause is the actual small business subcontracting plan clause itself. This identifies what's required uh, in a subcontracting plan, and it takes you from cradle to grave, before ward, 
after award, how, to, uh, how you can find small businesses, uh, what, what actions you are required to take, uh, and then also reporting requirements after award. Next slide, please. So that first clause I mentioned is 52.219-8. And paragraph B calls out that statutory requirement from the Small Business Act that it's the policy of the US government that not just small businesses, but small disadvantaged business, women-owned small business, veteran-owned, service-disabled vets and hub zones will have the maximum practicable opportunity to perform contracts let by any federal agency. Next slide, please. And the sec and that uh, paragraph C says that you agree to carry out this policy of the United States government in awarding subcontracts to the fullest extent, but also consistent with efficient contract performance. Okay, fullest extent, you agree to implement maximum practicable opportunity for small business, small disadvantaged business, et cetera, to the fullest extent. Next slide, please. Okay, now in the past, when I first came to the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization back in 2014, I saw a lot of small business subcontracting plans that had, age, uh, had GSA's agency small business goals in the plan. And yet when I looked at actual reporting being done by our contractors, it, it showed that basically our small business subcontracting plans uh, had minimum goals for small business, small disadvantage, women owned, et cetera. They did not reflect maximum opportunity. Let me give you an example, and I'll use a construction example. Uh, so there was a contractor out, a uh, construction contractor who was going to be doing work for GSA out in Oxnard, California. And they proposed the agency goals, which at the time for small business was 29%. Uh, and they proposed the statutory requirements um, for, um, uh, 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 Chris, if you can go back one more slide, that would be great. Okay, uh, uh, previous, I think we jumped ahead. There we go. All right, so, so this contractor proposed the agency goal of 29% for small business and 5% for women owned and 3% for service disabled, et cetera, okay? Uh, and in their narrative, they said, oh, and we can meet these goals because we did a construction job for the Corps of Engineers not too long ago in Oxnard, California, and we got 67% for small business. Oh, and oh, by the way, 15% for service disabled veteran owned small business. So in essence, what they were offering GSA under its subcontracting plan for the work we were going to do was a, 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 a gross bare minimum. It did not reflect a, a goal that would provide an incentive for the prime contractor to find and uh, obtain small business, small disadvantaged, women-owned, veteran-owned, service-disabled vets and hub zone to participate as required by the statute. Agency goals are just that. They're the agency goals that we negotiate with the SBA every year. Each agency does that. And that goal is helping then government wide to achieve the statutory goals listed in the Small Business Act. All right. Um, when we set goals at a maximum practicable opportunity level, it also benefits our customer agencies who use our GSA schedule contracts, not only for them when they issue a task order. They get this small, and, and if that task order is set aside for small business, that funding agency gets that small business credit. They also get small business subcontracting credit for any agency funded actions under that subcontracting plan. Next slide, please. Okay. So the subcontracting plan in that clause 52219-9 lists 15 elements, which I've tried to, to um, um, 
categorize, if you will, on this particular slide. So the first is the actual goals, the dollars and percentages that you anticipate will go to various types of small businesses. It will describe what it is you're subcontracting for and to what type of entity is it going to go to a large business, if you will, or a woman owned small business or a service disabled veteran owned small business. It'll explain how the plan was developed and, and, and what actions are gonna be done throughout the life of the plan to make sure that these goals are achievable. It will also identify the person responsible for administering the plan and duties and reports that they're gonna to keep to support their actions. Uh, and then also uh, makes a commitment to uh, uh, file the required reports under 52.219-9 in the electronic subcontract reporting system. There's also some various assurances that were added um, about four or five years ago where the contractor agrees to provide uh, that they assure that they will do all they can in accordance with the terms and conditions to pay their small business subcontractors on time uh, and also utilize the small businesses that they used in putting any proposals together. Next slide, please. Now, how your performance is evaluated is according to the regulations that you're making a good faith effort to maximize those opportunities for small business, small disadvantaged business, women-owned, veteran-owned service disabled vets and hubs them. Okay, that is the basis for evaluating the subcontracting plan performance. And what is a good faith effort is actually defined in the Small Business Administration regulations at 13 CFR. Okay, Congress directed uh, SBA to also update their definition to define what is a failure to make a good faith effort. So that citation in 13 CFR also includes what would be a failure of, to make a good faith effort. An example is failing to submit the required subcontracting reports on time or within the time frames that FAR 52-219-9 establishes, okay? And failing to make a good faith effort in FAR 52-219-9, it says, if you fail to make a good faith effort, it will be considered a material breach of contract. Anytime you have a material breach of contract, it's, it's putting your company at risk. And when it comes to subcontracting plans, it puts you at risk for the assessment of liquidated damages. All right, next slide, please. So what does GSA and the Small Business Administration look for in a subcontracting plan? Well, I reached out to Linda Valdez because her administrative contracting officers deal with your, especially the commercial subcontracting plans uh, and ask them, hey, what pain points are you running into? And boy, they came back with a lot of suggestions, which unfortunately I haven't had a chance to compile yet, but Chris said that she would give them out to all of you uh, so that you have it once I, I complete that little project. Okay, so stay tuned, that will be coming uh, your way. So, but let me tell you in a nutshell what we look for in a subcontracting plan. Does the plan reflect maximum practicable opportunities for the various types of small businesses to participate? Again, warning, agency goals, using an agency goals is basically Agency goals are provided only for information purposes only. It should be reflective of what it is you are going to outsource for, what you're going to subcontract for, what good faith effort you're going to make uh, in that subcontracting plan. So we also want to see, is there any growth? Just like any goal, any goal in our own individual performance plans where we work, right? we wanna show growth over any past achievement or is it the same old, same old, same old? I remember reviewing a report in ESRS and I went back to 2007 and it was the same, 
you know, same garbage, bottom line. Uh, it really did not reflect a good faith effort. We also want to make sure that the narrative of the plan supports the goals proposed, just like I gave you in that example of that construction contractor out in Oxnard, California. That narrative did not support those low goals that they were giving GSA. And let me tell you, when you have a subcontracting plan that tells a good small business story, they are a breeze to review and get through uh, the process. Uh, and, and it makes our jobs easier even after award. Next slide, please. So some of the common mistakes that I've seen, and again, more to come on this, but not keeping your market research fresh. In other words, not seeking new small businesses, small disadvantaged, women-owned, veteran-owned, service-disabled vets and hub zones. Okay, why is that important? Well, in, in today's marketplace, it's not like it was even five years ago. There is so much innovation coming out from the small business community, okay? Making us and our lives so much easier. Um, uh, 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 about five years ago, I was talking to a, uh, a um, friend of mine who manages a building, uh, a realty company in Philadelphia. And I asked him, for example, about his subcontracts. You know, how, how long are the agreements that he has with his, his suppliers? And he said, Deb, no more than five years. He said, because the marketplace changes constantly. So we always try to keep our market research fresh. Well, we're required to do that as contracting officers, keeping our market research fresh and I encourage you to do the same. ESRS reports, uh, man, check what you've been doing and reporting year after year after year. If you're giving the same bland excuse of why you're not meeting your small business subcontracting goals, something's not working. Um, did you do what you said you were going to do in the plan? Maybe you need to up your game a little bit or try something different failing to follow directions in reporting after award. And this is so important. The data in ESRS is so critical. It is used by Congress on behalf of the United States taxpayer to show how much dollars is actually getting into various types of small businesses' hands. If the data is wrong, we're sending the wrong story to Congress. Uh, for example, if you have an individual type subcontracting plan, the current goal has to be updated to include uh, any options that have been exercised to date. This was the finding by GAO in looking at our contracts, the administration that we did of our subcontracting plans, or that the cumulative is not really cumulative. It's not building on the last report. Uh, so obviously, you know, we need to make sure that we're following the directions that are right there on the ESRS homepage. And again, as promised, we'll be providing you um, uh, some direction on what our ACOs have seen. Uh, next slide, please. All right. You also have to understand that the FAR requires that these subcontracting plans become a material part of the contract. This is required by the FAR upon award. So it's incorporated in full text. And what does material mean? Well, it's just as important as those specifications, the quality, the price, okay? And so we need to administer them as any other material part of the contract. And you need to appreciate that as our industry partners that we will be doing just that. And as I mentioned before, uh, since it is a material part of the contract, it can be subject to liquidated damages. But as I said to GAO at the end brief, they asked, how often have you um, uh, invoked liquidated damages? And I said, if, we're have, if we have to invoke liquidated damages, then both parties have failed in that contract. We haven't done a good job in administering that subcontracting plan throughout the life of that contract. Next slide, please. That should be a last resort. So as I mentioned before, performance is measured according to the regulation by good faith effort. So I encourage you 
there is space in your ESRS reports and our good contractors in the remarks section will actually document what good faith effort they did during that per reporting performance period, okay? I encourage you to do that. Take a look at where good faith is defined in the SBA regulations. And, and again, um, failing to make a good faith effort, such as not reporting in ESRS, not reporting on time, or not reporting accurately could put your company at risk for the assessment of liquidated damages. Next slide, please. Okay. So how do you find small businesses? You know, maybe you've relied on, you know, the same thing, you know, year after year. All right. So what, how do you find small businesses? Well, first of all, did you do what FAR 52.219-9 requires? Paragraph D talks about what goes into a subcontracting plan. And later in that clause, there, it lists about seven actions that you are required to do. And they're the same actions that we are required to do as contracting folks. You know, can we break up our requirement into something smaller that small businesses can participate in? You know, that's one of the items, for example. Our model subcontracting plan that we use in our solicitations and contracts has some things in there too. And it tells you that the socioeconomic categories is a way to double your dollars, if you will, in crediting various types of small businesses. Are you doing that? Are you searching for small businesses who meet more than one socioeconomic category? Maybe there's a supplier out there who's a service disabled veteran owned small business who's also a woman owned small business. Well, you would get credit. You could apply that subcontracted dollars against women owned, service disabled vet, veteran owned, as well as small business. So if you made a $10,000 subcontract award to that type of company, you can achieve basically $40,000 in credit. Uh, is your small business liaison officer in sync with your purchasing department? Or are you kind of in a stovepipe organization? Maybe you need to take a look at that. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of our small business technical advisors had to relocate to be close to family. And she actually became the small business liaison officer for one of our big companies. She is brought in early in an acquisition process to find out what small businesses are out there and what that requirement is even before a proposal is put together. Maybe you need to do that. Another one of our scheduled contractors puts on their website, right on the homepage, vendor resources, where small businesses can come in and uh, give their capability statements. Does your website, is, that, is, is it welcoming to small businesses? That particular company even posted a copy of their current commercial subcontracting plan with GSA. Um, that really shows a commitment that they're willing to do that right up front. Not that I'm saying you have to, but hey, um, it, 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 it is an inviting. It sends that message that they're committed to small businesses. Your commercial marketing representative at the Small Business Administration, their job is to help you find qualified small businesses. Uh, you also may want to check minority business councils as well uh, and procurement technical assistance centers. While procurement technical assistance centers are there to assist small businesses navigate government contracting, they help them, they help them put together capability statements. So they'd be more than happy to share you know, what it is you need for your subcontracts to share with you uh, what's out there in the small business community. Next slide, please. Now your existing suppliers may not be in the dynamic small business search. They may not be in SAM.gov. FAR 52.219-9, that subcontracting plan clause tells you, you can accept a subcontractor's written representation of their small business size and socioeconomic status. Uh, of whether they're a small business, small disadvantage, veteran-owned, uh, service-disabled vet um, company. However, for HUBZone, they have to be certified by small SBA as a 
hub zone, but you can encourage them and point them in the right direction to the SBA to get certified. So what does this mean for you? Well, I'm gonna give you another story. I like stories. I learn contracting by stories. Um, and I'm sure maybe of you have done the same. One of our uh, leasing um, scenarios uh, up in upstate New York, it was a new building that was being built. And the construction contractor reached out to their SBA commercial marketing representative to find small businesses to support that um, um, construction job. Uh, but they also realized that one of their, their, that their steel supplier was Native American, which would be a small disadvantaged business. And with the White House emphasis on racial equity, you know, those SDBs are going to become more important as well as hub zones, right? I mean, you, you see the writing on the wall, you see that that's coming. Um, so, what they did was, but he didn't see them registered in Dynamic Small Business Search or SAM.gov. So he gave them the NAICS code for steel and said, are you small? He knew he could be considered a disadvantaged business because he's Native American, but he wasn't sure if he met the size status for small. And after giving him the NAICS code for steel, lo and behold, they are a small disadvantaged business. So the, the prime could take, could put in their subcontracting plan dollars for small disadvantaged business, as well as dollars for small, small business. And then give them the FAR definitions of small disadvantaged businesses, women-owned small business, veteran-owned and service disabled vet. It's a great way. You're probably already subcontracting the small businesses, but maybe you're under the false impression that they have to be in dynamic small business search. No, you don't. According to paragraph um, C2, you can accept their written representation. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we conclude, partnering, and, and gosh, Region 3 does such a great job in partnering with the QPC, our industry partners here at GSA, not only helps us meet our goals here at GSA, but any of our funding agencies to meet their own important, their own particular goals. But more importantly, it gets dollars into small businesses, small disadvantaged, women-owned, veteran-owned, service disabled vet and hub zone. That's, that's the primary goal. And then that benefits, benefits us as US taxpayers. Next slide. Oh, I think that's it. <laughs> That was, I think that was it. Any questions that uh, you may have? I do, yeah, it looks like we've got one question we can squeeze in. Okay. Um, one of the vendors asked, what if my small business supplier is no longer small? What can I do? Well, take a look at, um, that, that's an excellent question. Um, here's how it works for the federal government. When we award a contract, if the contractor is small at the time the contract or that order is awarded, they are considered small for the life of that contract, okay? So um, what is the length of time for that particular contract? If they were small a year ago and you have a five-year contract with them, I, I would think they would still be small. OK, unless they've been bought out by somebody else and now they're other than small and that happens. All right. And especially in this day and age the you know, the marketplace is just so volatile that way. That's why you have to keep your market research fresh, participate in various types of con uh, conferences, women, women's groups, you know, all of those. So keep it fresh so that you're not caught in the loop. And then let's say you get caught, that's where you tell that story. Southwest Airlines, for example, uh, right before COVID had reported that uh, they had a woman owned small business for janitorial services who outgrew that. So that reflect, reflected why they dipped during that reporting period, but then they were able to pull it back up because they found somebody else to substitute. 
Good question. Thank you. All right. Well, terrific. And thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, that concludes um, the our formal our formal session. I want to thank Deb and all of our speakers that took part in the formal part of today's Quality Partnership Council. Um, we, we have breakout sessions, which we're really excited about, but before I get into that, I wanna make sure everyone understands that the Q, all questions and answers will be typed and sent with the recording and the slides. Um, just give us a couple days to get all of that together and that will land in your inbox. And um, yeah, if you don't have time to stay for the breakout sessions, thank you for joining us. Um, if you do, let's get right to that.